management, and we thought maybe we could help, and that's where the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership was born. We purposely decided not to become an entity um, because we didn't want uh, it to become more powerful than what we were trying to do. So we kept it very casual. We kept it very uh, loosely knit. And as you can see on the mission slide you're looking at, um, we inform, we connect, inform, and support. But we don't try to tell uh, collaborators how to do what they're doing. We just, we just support them when they ask for some help. And uh, that's worked out very well over the years. Um, we, uh, we are a diverse group, um, as I said, you know, some of us were on opposite sides of the timber wars back in the day, um, but we worked in all facets of forest management. We've got foresters working for government, for sawmill companies. We have the Wilderness Society. I had the Wilderness Society at that time, uh, the Idaho Conservation League, the Nature Conservancy, and, um, and we, uh, we, we had to, uh, find some zone of agreement. Uh, not everybody in that group was supportive of all kinds of forest uh, practices. And so we uh, narrowed our focus down to forest collaborative or forest uh, restoration projects. Uh, we, we support collaboratives. Um, we did find our own zone of agreement. If you could turn to that map, the next slide there, Carolyn. We did that. We had to work to find our own zone of agreement. Uh, what you're seeing here is a slide of all the collaboratives that are currently operating. They've, they've changed a bit over the years, but uh, as you can see, we've got Idaho pretty well covered there. This is a map that uh, Dennis puts on the website for us and maintains. Um, I have to say that we had several meetings where we kind of uh, had to really explore everybody's uh, attitudes towards forest management because uh, when we got to more moist forests and North Idaho forests, um, there were a lot of things that uh, weren't quite as easy as just doing the um, the pine forests where we uh, uh, could practice just basically fire firewise activities and and uh, and not have to make some of the impacts that we had to make in other places. But we found most of those zones of agreements. We have found places we just agree to disagree, and and that's worked out pretty well over the years. Uh, Caroline, if you go to the next, whoops, wait a minute, hang on. Uh, yeah, from the start we uh, um, we wanted to keep the forest restoration and collaboratives uh, in front of policymakers. In fact, that first meeting, we actually had a letter from all the uh, congressional representatives from Idaho supporting that first conference. And immediately after that conference, we uh, addressed our own letter to the governor and to the uh, uh, Idaho delegation explaining what uh, Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership was going to do and how we were gonna do it. Um, We've stayed in touch with, uh, we've always had the support of staffers for the four offices of, of uh, um, our, our congressional representatives. Um, but in, if you could go to the next slide then, Caroline, Rishi, thank you. Uh, I'm the guy there without the tie. And I'm effectively uh, hiding uh, Mike Simpson. Oops, go back one. Going the wrong way. Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Go back one more. There you go, right there. Thank you. Um, so that's me hosting a press conference. And in, in 2014, we had a uh, the entire congressional delegation, not just their staffers, showed up for uh, uh, about an hour and a half at our uh, meeting in, in the Riverside Hotel in, in Boise. Uh, this is me introducing them at a con uh, press conference. You can see that. Uh, Mike Simpson's missing. He's not really missing. He's hidden behind me somehow, and I didn't. Uh, I, pretty, hiding him pretty effectively near, as I can tell. And then over the far right, uh, hopefully you recognize uh, Raul Labrador, um, Jim Rish, and uh, Mike Crapel. Uh, if you see uh, on the far right there, that's Chief Tidwell, who was the chief of the Forest Service at the time in 2014. And um, so that was that conference. Uh, so we we uh, I put this on here just to show that we are keeping in touch and we are trying to to push uh, forest collaboration and some of the projects we have um, and being pretty effective at it. If you go to the next slide, uh, Caroline. And this is Rick Tholen and I, um, the Nature Conservancy in 2017 hosted five of us to go to, uh, well, several of us, I think um, it was uh, to go to Washington DC and we met with a number of uh, congressional committees, not just Idaho delegation, but uh, some of the committees that were working hard to, uh, we went to support the wildfire funding reforms that were being debated at the time and the fixes to the farm bill and the GNA rules, which uh, 
I'm not going to say we we caused it, but that was a very good outcome because uh, um, the next year the Congress passed everything we were asking that we were supporting anyway, and probably some then. Um, so we have uh, maintained a good connection with our congressional folks. I think we've made some headway that way, um, and uh, I hope we continue. I think we will continue to do that. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. This, um, so out of the eight people that started the uh, IFRP, we've, uh, we've lost one member um, when he passed away. This is uh, Jack Lavin. Um, he was, uh, he's the retired Boise National Forest Supervisor and, and he was active in the SAF and he was very active in putting the IFRP together. In fact, he, uh, he was a huge influence on the way that we decided to operate with uh, collaborative groups and, and, um, and, what, and how, to, how to help them. Um, he passed away in 2013, and thanks to uh, his family, uh, Rick Bolin, who uh, worked with his family, the SAF chapter in Southern Idaho, um, and IFRP created a fund in his memory to help people who wish to learn more or participate more in collaboration. So we try to provide the Jack Lavin Fund exists, and we have used it a number of times the last few years to help people travel to a, a either our conferences or to other meetings and trainings that would, that would further their ability to, uh, to help with collaboratives and to help form forest collaboratives, to help uh, form good decision makings and good projects on the, in the Forest Service um, venue. So um, I guess I would encourage you to take a look at uh, this. If you have a few extra dollars or need a tax deduction, uh, please support this fund. Uh, it's been a very useful fund. It's been a very good use of money, I believe. And it is a tax deductible donation if you donate here on this on the Forest Restoration Partnership page here. We would appreciate that. Go to the next slide, Caroline. Uh, this is uh, this is with eight members that started the IFRP back in the day. Um, uh, very few of us still are participating. Everybody's moved on in a lot of ways. Um, John McCarthy retired early on and and has found happiness being a DJ for the uh, jazz station in the uh, uh, local Radio Boise, which is a community supported radio station. It's all volunteers here, as I can tell. Uh, Will Wayland, uh, if you were at the uh, last meeting um, in Boise, that short meeting we had in May, uh, it was his last meeting with us. He's retired and uh, has found a, a retirement in, uh, occupation as being the uh, executive director of the Idaho Coalition Land Trust. Seems very happy over there. Uh, buddy's not helping us anymore, and and uh, uh, that energy is going over there. Morris Huffman is still involved, and in, he's no longer on the IFRP, but he is still on the steering committee for the Boise Forest Coalition. He's still uh, very active and, and involved. Rick Tholen, um left us this year. Um, he retired several years ago from the BLM, and and uh, he left the IFRP this year. He said something about a granddaughter in Montana. I think was was his, his main occupation now. And, uh, uh, and he's still involved in the Payette uh, Forest Coalition as well. So that leaves John Robinson and I are the only two out of the original eight that are still uh, hanging out with the IFRP. I'll stick around, I think, for a while. I bet John will too. Uh, we are now surrounded by lots of new talent in the form of Michael Gibson of the Trout Unlimited, Terry Koska, who took Will's position at the Nature Conservancy, and Peter Stegner, who is a former congressional staffer for Senator, Senator Craper, Crapo, and a partner in Riley Stegner, which is a natural resource policy consultant firm. And we are ably assisted by about a dozen of our advisory board, um, which is, uh, they represent very interests, very various interests in Idaho, the lumber manufacturing companies, federal and state management agencies, facilitation uh, entities, um, very helpful and keep us, keep us on our track. Um, Go to the last slide, if you would. Thank you. Well, let's go one more. Thank you. Um, so we all accomplished a great deal over the last decade. Now, now we are in a new, uh, new, new world. I think, in a little way. Um, now, Idaho has been has has the first shared stewardship agreement in the nation, and the governor is pressing ahead with it. What role do the collaborators have? Uh, what do they want to have uh, in this new era? We, we've chosen four presentations uh, to present to you for the next two days to explore that question. 
I'm only sorry that we can't have the one-on-one -on -one discussions that our uh, past conferences have been very good at. I think we get some great input from everybody. I hope this chat function will work very well uh, in that regard. Uh, and, and I hope that we can get your um, opinions and your impressions uh, uh, aired as much as we can. Um, uh, so now I think I'm going to get out of your way. Um, we, uh, we've got some great moderators and presenters coming, and uh, we want to get on with the 10th uh, annual IFRP conference, uh, virtual. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our two moderators. Uh, Dr. John Freemuth is a distinguished professor of uh, public policy and a Cecil Andrus Endowed Chair of Environment and Public Lands at BSU. I hope I got that right, John. He's the endowed chair with the uh, Cecil Andrus on, uh, Policy Group. And, uh, and down at Dr. Dennis Becker, who is a professor in the natural resource policy and a dean and the dean of the College of Natural Force, Natural Resources at U of I. And sorry I botched that, Dennis. And uh, let's move on to them. I think John, is that who we're moving to? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, John. Um, I was able to all, uh, almost all of these. I only missed one. And I think I'll just add real quickly to some of the stuff John's already brought up about the significance of this IFRP, which he rightly said, sort of became the umbrella for all the forest collaboratives that were already doing pretty good work. And it became John and, and Will and others idea to kind of put an umbrella over it to help. If you're really interested and you don't know about some of the prior conferences, Dennis Murphy, who John mentioned, has done just a marvelous job at, at keeping all of that on the web page, and you can go back to day one and see how it started and how it's evolved up until today. It's a pretty neat story. And just to add, John did mention we were able to have the entire delegation come to one of them, and that was quite an event. Joined by the chief, uh, Tidwell, at that particular conference, we've had regional foresters, two of them, I think, and almost every one, two undersecretaries of agriculture over time, uh, experts, I guess, from some of our great land grants talking about collaboration from the U of I, from the University of Montana, and from Colorado State University, and also lots of substantive information that's been presented on fire, res resilience, measures of success, and so forth and so on. So if you've got time and you want to kind of delve back into that business again, it's just a great library. Um, a couple other things I, I wanted to mention just briefly is we were, to raise the visibility of this group, we uh, about four years ago held an Andrus conference called Why Public Lands Matter. And several people, Andy Brunel, Will, and Bill Higgins, had a, about an hour and a half during the day to talk about AFRB and forest collaboratives. And I think it raised the visibility of what we're doing here in Idaho to people who weren't as familiar with it. Another thing we hope to do in September in terms of raising visibility for all of this good work going on is the Society of Environmental Journalists are bringing their national conference, knock on wood, assuming it happens, to Boise State on campus but there's gonna be a lot of other uh, field trips and so forth that go out and study some of these issues. And we're working on one of those trips coming up north to the McCall area to talk to the Payette Forest Coalition and learn about at least one uh, and maybe more of our collaboratives. And you're gonna have some of the best journalists in America that might go on that field trip and be able to tell your story in forums that maybe it hasn't been noticed before. So I think that's, that's really exciting. The last thing I want to mention is when, you, when we talk a lot about collaboration, um, very quickly when Dennis uh, became the chair of the PAG, uh, the policy analysis group, um, it, it dawned on me, well, this is a classic example of something we don't see a lot in Idaho, which is inter-university collaboration. So um, it was great to get him on board. And now, of course, he's an integral part of all of this with uh, shared stewardship and some of the work through the College of Forestry. 
I will point out that in 2010, Dennis was an assistant professor at Minnesota. Now he's dean of forestry at, at Idaho. And at this rate, he's going to be president of the United States in 10 years. So let me turn it over to Dennis to welcome you. And then we'll be all be watching to see when Governor Little is able to join this meeting. So Dennis, go ahead. Hey, John, thanks for that. There's no damn way I'm doing anything higher than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that. You know, the, the stakes are too high for us all to not uh, work together on these important issues. And that really includes um, all the agencies, the companies, the conservation groups, the community groups, all of you on the line here today who really care about our forests. So, you know, I appreciate that introduction. As, as John Roberts and Dr. Freeman shared, the purpose of the IFRP is really to bring together these ideas and challenge each other and, and to chart a course of action for the future of our forests. And, as we know, that's not always been easy, but you know, the thing about this group is that we've always been up for the task. You know, take for example, August 2018, US Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, announced a new strategy for managing catastrophic wildfires and the impacts from invasive species, drought, insects, and disease epidemics. That strategy is what we now refer to as shared stewardship. US Forest Service Chief Vicki Christensen described shared stewardship as a way of working together in an integrated way to make decisions and to take actions on the land. Later that year in December, Idaho, as John mentioned, became the first state to sign a shared stewardship agreement with the Forest Service, where we committed to doubling the number of acres treated on federal lands within five years. That's no, no small feat. That agreement soon became the example of interagency collaboration for other states to follow. Then following May last year, as, as John and John talked about at our annual conference in Boise, we convene many of you to begin that hard work of deciding how and where to implement shared stewardship in the state. Governor Little and Undersecretary Hubbard at the time provided opening remarks. If you recall, if you were there, they challenged us to incorporate local planning and forest collaboratives in our decisions. They challenged us to think big with a laser focus on implementation. The regional foresters and their representatives talked about priority landscapes. State Forester and his colleagues talked about the statewide forest action plan and all the analytical tools at our disposal. And during the next 12 months, those partners, many of you that are joining us today have worked tirelessly to establish two priority landscapes for treatment and what we now refer to as the first one, the Northern Idaho Priority Landscape, which is a two million acre region centered around Coeur d'Alene and Sandpoint with uh, considerable private industri industrial and non-industrial lands national forest, state lands, and some tribal forest lands mixed in there, and the southern Idaho priority landscape, which is about 2.3 million acres of national forest, BLM state, non-industrial, industrial lands in that Highway 95, Highway 55 corridor through New Meadows, Cascade, and Council. So we're going to focus on those for today and tomorrow during this abbreviated conference. Um, the speakers will update you on current plans, and we're going to ask you for your input and next steps about how we move forward. In particular, we want you to think about what success look like, looks like. What are the metrics of success? What can we do to continue to make progress towards those goals? Are we making progress? Is everybody incorporated that needs to be involved in these decisions? Your questions, um, to remind you to pose those in the chat box on the side of your screen. And, and I might just mention, or might just ask as you share your ideas, if you could remember this is to tell us where you're from. That just might help the speakers a little bit to interpret the questions and, and help, help with the answers. So I'll, I'll end now by stating that the, imp the importance of forest collaboratives, you all know that, but you know, you know that the success of this work and that of shared stewardship really depends on all of our collective engagement. That's the same engagement we've shown all these years, 11 years of this, of this partnership and these conferences, but certainly all the tireless work that you guys do outside of that. So anyway, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to kick it back now to Dr. Freemuth to get us started. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that the governor is now with us. I'm not sure he is yet, but we will, we will sort of um, bide some time talking about this stuff a little more. We'll get a notice, everybody, the minute we know he's online and ready to go. Obviously, given um, his schedule and everything he is having to deal with right now, he may not be able to hit it right at uh, 1.30, we hope so. As Dennis said, and, and let me reiterate, as uh, the governor will speak to us for about 
15 minutes, we hope at least. And then if the, your questions come in to me, and yeah, if you can remember to say where, who you are and where you're from, it's fine if, that, if you forget. Um, this Zoom stuff, we all are kind of learning as we go a lot of the time. That's fine, and I will try to read any, all the questions I can as long as we have uh, the governor with us. The, his staff will notify us, I guess, when um, he is available, and it's supposed to be any minute, but again, we're not, you know, we can't manage that. We can just be ready for him when he comes in. Um, and I should add that all the panels, as far as I know, will have the ability to uh, have chat questions, won't they? If we have time, uh, Dennis, I know, is moderating one later today with the regional foresters and Craig Foss and uh, Peg Policcio, who will, after uh, Governor Little speaks, will take over and be the moderator for uh, a pretty good discussion on shared stewardship here, sort of a first look with a panel of a lot of uh, different sort of expertise and folks um, there. And then the same thing will happen tomorrow, too. We'll try to have plenty of uh, time through chat to answer your questions. And Dennis and I will try to sum up today and tomorrow. Today it'll be basically about shared stewardship, I think. If the governor does bring up some other things, we certainly can talk about that. And we'll do the same thing tomorrow. Um, so that's, that's sort of the plan. There are breaks. There's a 250 break in here. And of course, everybody knows that it is online. You can mute your your video if if something like somebody comes to your front door and the dog barks or something you can go take care of that you have to sit there if there's an emergency um anything you're else? on i see the governor's on the governor on where is he he's got his he's got his own window hmm. all right let me get rid of this here hang on a second and close this nobody's old enough there he is Okay, everybody. So let me. Uh, the guy old enough to know the Brady Bunch. <laughs> there we go. So everybody, we're fortunate to have with us uh, our governor, Brad Little of Idaho. I'll be pretty brief. We all know him, but I want to say a couple of important things. This is his fourth appearance at IFRP, so I think it certainly suggests to us that the governor is is very committed to the idea of working together to solve some of our public land and forest issues. He also, I should add, at, uh, at our Andrus conferences, he has appeared at least five or six times, Governor. So that's been, again, another sign of his, um, his belief in being part of solutions to our public problems. Before I turn it over to him, I just wanna say probably on behalf of all of us, Governor, thank you for your leadership during our era of the virus. We all appreciate it. So floor is yours. Thank you, John, and uh, John, uh, and thank all of you for being part of this. Uh, let, let me get what's top of mind on everybody's mind, uh, uh, get through that, uh, which is what we're doing on uh, COVID and uh, Stay Home 2.0, which I'm, uh, by tomorrow at this time, it'll be, uh, we'll have a new executive order. I think there's a draft on my desk right now for me to look at. Um, and, and what that's going to look like. Uh, obviously, those of you uh, uh, zooming in on this call, uh, what, what's resource management, uh, what's recreation going to look like this summer is, is top of mind. Uh, the, the forest supervisors that are on the call, I had a call with them a week or so ago, and uh, one of the issues is what happens in the surrounding states? As my neighbors in Oregon and Washington um, have a significant uh, shutdown in their states, uh, what does that do to us in Idaho from a recreation standpoint? Um, as we try and maintain social distancing and safety, uh, you know, we can do that okay with the number of people in Idaho, but if we get all the recreation out of those other two states, it creates uh, a bigger problem. And when I'm, I have a call every week with all the county commissioners, with all the mayors, and uh, those very mayors and county commissioners that love 
tourism dollars coming in have a whole different attitude about it today, uh, about uh, who's coming into their communities, who's using uh, their emergency services, who's shopping at their grocery stores. Uh, those are all things that are top of mind um, right now in Idaho. So the recreation side of, of outdoor uh, recreation and forest is is uh, is pretty wild right now. I I saw I've got a uh, Governor Brown and I've got a call Monday or tomorrow. I I think maybe tomorrow, and I'm I'm sure that's what she wants to talk about. Uh, but we're trying to make it to where uh, nobody gets an inordinate amount of the pressure. Uh, you're all well aware that we the fish and game. Uh, quit issuing out-of-state tags. Uh, that was uh, in response to a lot of the hue and cry we had from uh, our rural areas. Uh, we all know what's taking place on on boat ramps and campgrounds. Uh, so that's uh, that's a critical issue. <clears throat> Some states, their state home orders are are much uh, narrower than ours. I'm trying to urge people to get outdoors and enjoy the outdoors, but still maintain their social distancing. The issue is, is the stores and the bathrooms and the, uh, the places where people uh, tend to uh, have a problem with social distancing. If you're a rural community with one little gas station or one little store, um, and, and those are the areas I'm most concerned about because they have the shallowest healthcare system. Uh, those visitors that come here and infect the people that live there, leave and go back to their uh, big city with a good healthcare system, but they leave my poor rural communities um, with a community spread. And uh, those are some of the problems that we're trying to address. Early on, we talked about this. I, I can't even remember where I was. I, uh, I, um, I might've been at Lewiston at the airport uh, where the guy has all the helicopters, but I, you know, these fire camps next summer are going to look a lot different than they had before. I was at uh, IOEM, our warehouse, where we uh, put out for, for personal protective equipment this morning and, and what a fire camp is going to look like uh, to maintain the hygiene level. Not that fire camps aren't always uh, very nice and clean uh, and the firefighters aren't always nice and clean, but uh, we've got enough time. Uh, but it's going to look different, uh, and and heaven forbid uh, we have a bad fire year. It looks like right now we're going to be okay. We have a bad fire year, and then we've got a lot of restrictions on on our uh, men and women who fight fire. So uh, those are uh, outdoor recreation. Obviously, the forest products industry is a is a critical industry, uh, particularly if you're in the toilet paper business. It's very critical, and uh, uh, we want that to go forward. Uh, all the commodity prices are way down, and uh, you know housing starts are are a little uh, touchy right now. Uh, so we want the uh, the timber industry to uh, continue to go forward. Uh, you know the hospitality industry is going to take a body blow for quite a while. Um, we've got to have some other industries that uh, keep uh, powering our economic engine going forward and a lot of those are dependent upon uh, the, the uh, great outdoors that we all love here in Idaho. Uh, as far as uh, the collaboration and shared stewardship, uh, I'll let uh, uh, Peg or uh, Dustin uh, talk about what we're doing. We're doing a lot. Uh, I Normally at this time in the year I'd be uh, getting uh, calls from other governors about what's going on. Uh, my life is is Corona, COVID, all day, every day, and unfortunately, we're not uh, don't have the luxury to talk about the things I want to talk about. Uh, but that model uh, that we have today, uh, uh, what we've been doing, we don't want to lose uh, the progress we've made. So, uh, for those of you that are uh, that are at this meeting, attending this meeting. Uh, thanks for your good work in the past. Uh, you're going to have to do a little more work in the future. Uh, 
possibly without the accolades you deserve. Uh, but believe me, uh, the people of Idaho, uh, the industry, uh, the people that recreate, the people that enjoy uh, the great outdoors, recreationists, hunters, uh, and the ecosystem uh, will be well served by what's uh, taken place in the past and the fact that we need to scale it up. Uh, the number of acres that we've that we've treated is is um, we all know uh, if you do the math, it takes a long time to get to where we're really uh, moving the needle uh, going forward to uh, build a more resilient forest. One of the things I think I think all the maybe Cheryl knows or somebody else knows on the call. I think all the uh, spring burning work that we wanted to do is. I think I saw that was one of the victims of, uh, maybe it was on that call, Cheryl, where we talked about it, uh, that it was, uh, uh, yeah, I can see people nod on this thing. I'm getting to be, uh, I'm getting to be quite the little Zoomer, so. Uh, but it's, you know, it's sad that we, we that, uh, the, the hard work isn't gonna come to fruition. Those, those trees will still, hopefully, uh, those trees will still be there next year and we need to continue to do that going forward. But of course, one of the issues with the COVID virus, because it's resp uh, respiratory, is, is uh, there'll be a lot of interest next summer not having those big fires. Uh, because if you've got uh, people that are uh, respiratory challenged, uh, whether it's allergies, whether it's asthma, uh, whether it's whatever it is, uh, a lot of smoke in the air is not going to be helpful. Uh, from that standpoint. For those of you that don't know, I am i think I'm in the queue uh, to be chairman of the Western Governors in two years. Um, uh, we're working on uh, Sam Eaton, who staffs WGA for me. Um, we're working on my initiative. Uh, it, it will be, uh, it will be resource related. Um, I'm, I'd be glad to get any of your input. I've got a little time before I have to announce it. Uh, but like I said, I've been all COVID all day uh, trying to keep the people of Idaho safe. And uh, tomorrow's a big day as we go uh, stay home 2.0 and how that'll look different. Uh, we, we're in a fairly good place here in Idaho, but we are really on the, on the edge as far as uh, what it's going to look like going forward. Uh, I don't know if you saw what took place in South Dakota. Governor Noem uh, was not a big fan of a big shutdown. And now uh, I think her biggest employer in South, her second biggest employer in South Dakota is out uh, because they've had wide community spread there. And you take a rural state and as that wide spread uh, uh, happens, It'll go out to these rural communities where you don't have a good healthcare system, and that's where people are are really going to be in jeopardy. And that's not just people that get uh, the coronavirus; uh, that's people that get hurt in a recreation accident or a logging accident or fill in the blank uh, because our you know we don't have a real robust healthcare facility. We got our, our, our capacity in Idaho. We got a great healthcare system. It's just it's just pretty light, so that's why what we're doing is so important. So uh, I don't know which one of you two, Johns. I'd be glad to try and ask questions if I can figure out. Oh, there, John Freemuth raised his hand. I always wanted to turn it's me. Me. Yeah. I, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> okay, um, Governor. I don't know how much time you have, so if if you've got to go, you've got to go to deal with these issues. People are supposed to be uh, now. Uh, sending me questions through chat. So I will, until some of them come in, I'll just start with, with one. We, um, we, we know how important these forest collaboratives are and you've already said how they matter to you and, and certainly the state of Idaho. What kind of words of encouragement can you give folks that are trying to do this at the time when now even their collaborative meetings have to be done through Zoom for a while and they don't have those face-to-face -face relationships that build the trust to allow us to do things. Any, any words of encouragement for everybody? Well, as a, I never thought I'd do uh, 
uh, Easter services on Zoom. I, I did uh, admit to my priest that I did drink coffee during church um, off the screen. Uh, but uh, I was in a, on a call this morning and we were talking about uh, healthcare. Uh, we really wanted to ramp up the way we deliver healthcare uh, in Idaho on a on a uh, technology basis, uh, and and we have really gotten there. So, you know, some of these collaboratives uh, where people in great big landscapes, uh, you know, uh, the Nez Clear, the, the Sawtooth, uh, the sacrifice that people have to make. Uh, to go to some of those meetings uh, will be a little less. But the old uh, uh, sitting in a circle and looking across the circle uh, at somebody or being around a campfire uh, is, is irreplaceable. Uh, I think this will be part of it as we, as we go forward. Uh, the body language that's uh, necessary when you can tell you're starting to say something and somebody gets uncomfortable, it's a little hard on these little bitty screens uh, compared to looking at them around a round table or a, a campfire. Uh, so it's it's not going to be it's not going to be perfect, but it's what we have to it's what we have to do. But I'm always an optimist. I think some of the technology that we've adapted is going to um, make a lot of things uh, better in the future. Uh, but I yearn to get back to that face-to-face -face con. Uh, uh, content. So when I say something crazy and and John Freemuth rolls his eyes and looks back, I know what I just did. So. You can't see that I'm rolling my eyes. Come on, Governor. Here's a question for you from John uh, Robinson of ICL. How can we both increase forest management and prescribe burning and at the same time be able to better protect the health of our, our people who do have those underlying health issues? Well, we got to, you know, the argument that my uh, forest health people have used for years is, is uh, burn me now or burn me later. Uh, uh, burn me in April when you got uh, April winds and clear skies, or burn me in August when uh, you got stagnant air and, and salmon doesn't see the sunshine for uh, weeks at a time. Uh, that's the point you have to make. But, but one of the big values of the collaborative, and John's been a, a big part of them, is, is when we all show up, people that are on this screen all show up, uh, coming from a variety of different, uh, from industry, from communities, from uh, uh, resource groups, from conservation groups, and all agree, uh, then the sales, uh, the sales job gets a lot easier. Uh, and and the fact that it's one of the things about the Western governors is it's bipartisan, and everybody agrees, regardless of whether it's Republican Congress or Democratic Congress or Republican governor or Democratic governor, that it's the right thing to do. Uh, that'll add momentum to it. But uh, fires have always <laughs> fires are always be controversial, and and of course the the fall burning uh, uh, when you know there's a snow coming is one thing, but if you tell people you've got to they got to uh, vacate their favorite hunting place, uh, them spite words. So uh, we'll get there. Uh, we'll get there, but it's going to be hard. But, you know, you just do the math on scaling up the projects we got to do. Uh, it's tough. Okay, here's, here's another question. It will come from me as I wait. I think people, this is really awkward, probably, Governor, for some people to type questions rather than just raise their hand. But I did some look at our old Andrus archives, and the first time I think you talked to an Andrus conference, you were you were Brad Little Rancher. Um, so you've been in this these conversations for a long time. Now you're the governor. Are you optimistic about where we are now with some of our issues versus maybe where we were in the '90s when we tended to fight a lot more, or do we have a long ways to go? A, we got a long ways to go, but B. Uh, you know, I went through the get out the cut years. I, uh, when I was a college intern, I worked for Jim McClure, who was uh, mm -hmm. uh, the king of get out the cut. And uh, then I saw the, uh, the conservation community. Uh, you know, I went through this, I've, I've been through the Spotted Owl. I've been through the Quincy Library Group. I've been through uh, 
and, and we're getting better at it. And what's more important is the uh, bipartisan support among governors and, and in Congress for some of the activities uh, that need to take place. So uh, I think we're in a better spot. You know, if you look at the polling that uh, the Idaho uh, Timber Products Commission does, uh, we're, we're fine in Idaho. Uh, people believe we need to actively manage these grounds. We need to preserve a uh, watershed wildlife habitat. We're fine. Um, uh, we have a little bit of a problem uh, sometimes when we get into the judicial arena. And we have a little bit of problem when we get to Congress. But as a consensus in the West, uh, we've made great, great progress. And uh, we know that the uh, climate is changing. We know that we've got ecosystems that are uh, not uh, don't have the balance they need. Uh, we know that the density, the silvicultural density is not uh, what anybody thinks is ideal. And uh, we've got to take some real aggressive actions uh, to make up for that. And I, I, but, but the short answer is we're in a better place than we were before. Okay, thanks. Here's a question from Tom Schultz, so I know you, you know. Um, it, it's long, so I'm going to try to summarize it. With, with um, the need to be out in the forest doing the work, administering the timber sale contracts and so forth, yet now we have COVID. You've already spoke to the problems we're going to have in wildland fire if people can't do the same things. How do you think we can ensure that our veg, veg management projects continue to be worked on? And can the state help the Forest Service in sale prep work with NEPA and things like that? Complicated question. Yes, <laughs> but but the uh, absolutely. I mean, that's what that's what this is about. And uh, uh, you know, if you're gonna if you go back to the concept and the theory and the legislative intent of NEPA, uh, nobody disagrees that if you're going to make a major decision, it's going to uh, a federal project that. Uh, we had to look at it. Uh, it's the original NEPA uh, with all the all the bold on uh, legal opinions uh, that that we've got to uh, get our arms around. Uh, and I know that this administration uh, now they're immersed in a lot of other uh, problems, but uh, we need to we need to get our arms around those NEPA problem and. Uh, and collaborative groups like this need to make recommendations on it. Uh, most people, when I visit with governors, uh, you know, think of NEPA and the public land west, um, until you tell them about a highway project and then they get real interested in it, uh, the problems that uh, NEPA has on a, on a highway project or another federal project, that if it's along a waterway uh, or, or something of that sort, um, we, there's, there's a body of evidence of some of the fundamental things we need to do to make NEPA work better. In my sense, in talking to governors and groups, uh, not only in Idaho, but outside of the state is, and it's all about kind of the details, but there, there's a consensus about how we need to make NEPA to where it works better, to where the professionals, um, uh, particularly the Forest Service and BLM are hamstrung, uh, that they're not locked to their desks, that they uh, can get out and do the resource work that they they actually hired on uh, to do. Okay, I just let me know if you, if you have to leave. There there are some more questions coming in. There's also again a lot of thank yous coming to you too for leadership. Again, I want to mention that. So I don't know if, if you know yet, but as some of the stimulus money comes to Idaho, is there going to be an ability to get some of it out and and. Idaho, which you know, is going to need a lot of help, and everybody from the commodity industries to the outfitters and everybody else like that, are you aware or certainly hopeful that some of that money can be, can be placed out there where it's going to be needed? We, uh, absolutely. There, and of course, there's, um, I was just on the phone with Senator Crapo half an hour ago about the uh, uh, CARES Act 2.0 or 3.0. I was on a call with the uh, uh, governors yesterday. Um, uh, the for the the current 1.25 billion that we've got at the state, 
Uh, that goes to state and local governments uh, to basically backfill COVID-related expenses. And to be real blunt about it, uh, the committee that I had working on it, uh, we have very few requests, but it has to be uh, uh, COVID-related uh, expenses. And, and we've implemented, I just got a text a minute ago uh, on a national basis, uh, my committee that's doing it is being held up as, uh, as uh, kind of a good example. Uh, Brandon Wolf, who serves on the land board uh, with me, who's the state controller, is going to put all the, all the expenditures in a transparent, uh, on his transparency website uh, so that people that apply for it need to know that it, it's going to be scrutinized. There is some funny money there. Now, on the industry side, uh, we're still waiting uh, for some of the guidance, uh, whether it go through the Small Business Administration, because if you're an outfitter, uh, you know, I, uh, one of my favorite outfitters that helps us brand calves, uh, he just was, wasn't getting enough uh, people uh, signed up and he just uh, closed up shop for the year. There's going to be some programs that are going to be there for them because you don't just create out of thin air an outfitter. Uh, they have to have a certain set of skills and if you think they're going to go away and Joe off the street's going to, going to know the real estate, they're going to know the rules, they're going to have the relationship with the agencies. Uh, I worry about, uh, just like I do some of my old agricultural friends, is if they, if, if they have a, a tough run, uh, they're going to be out of business. And I, I remember, I'll, I'll make this a, a little bit of a story, but when I was involved in the sheep industry, uh, they eliminated the sheep industry in Canada. And then they discovered in their big, big uh, uh, fur plantations uh, that uh, they were using Roundup to suppress the, the foliage when they, uh, uh, in those big clear cuts that they have in, in British Columbia, which are some of them are in the hundreds of thousands of acres, which we don't do here. Um, but those are crown lands up there in Canada. But they, they had discovered that a band of sheep or a bunch of sheep was the best way to suppress foliage to recover those ecosystems without using chemicals, without using Roundup. And of course, that's what we, that was without the current controversy on Roundup. Well, they had to put together schools to teach people how to pack a mule or light a lantern or do whatever else because the sheep industry was gone. And, you know, I've always been an advocate for using livestock as a, as a tool in some of these areas. Uh, and we use outfitters and we use hunters as a tool uh, to manage our ungulate population in certain areas. So the turmoil that's here, I worry about it. I think there's programs, uh, for some of these outfitters, some of these uh, businesses that are that are hospitality related that are out there, uh, but uh, this is going to we are not going to this is not going to blow over in a few weeks. Uh, I know that most events uh, for the summer uh, have been canceled. I think now maybe there's some of them still in the queue for August, uh, but uh, this this state's going to look a lot different when this is all said and done. But there are programs through the Small Business Administration. Those individuals that you ask about, John, one of the first place for them to go is uh, either our website, coronavirus.idaho.gov, or the SBA, Small Business Administration. Then they'll know whether they qualify. One more question. Have time, one more, you said? Yep. One more question. Okay, this is from Kerry Kotzka of the Nature Conservancy. We're an early adopter of shared stewardship. Uh, how do you see maybe yourself as a leader in Idaho uh, moving in and leveraging this, our role there and alerting other people to what a potentially good thing this is? Maybe through the Western governors, I don't know, but do you see some ways we can promote it to other states more? Well, John and Kerry, uh, there are a lot of different avenues. I think the best thing for us to do, just set a good example, and show where it's working, show where there's community buy-in. Uh, show the benefit to the resource, show the benefit to the community. Uh, those good stories sell themselves. And uh, that's, that's my, and you know, I'm a, 
uh, unapologetic advocate for it, and I will continue to do that. So. Okay. Well, Governor, I think you probably have to get going, so thank yeah, you. For I got Zoom 2.0 setting up here. All right. Good for you. Thank you very much. Thanks, for being thanks, with everybody. Us today. Thank you. Put me back on. We'll figure this thing out. <laughs> um, so at this point, I would like to turn the meeting over to Peg Pelliccio, who will be, she's Idaho Shared Stewardship Coordinator, and she will be moderating a panel uh, on North Idaho's shared steward, uh, stewardship, sorry, priority landscape, a first look with a pretty distinguished set of folks. So Peg, when you're ready, I think we're ready for you if this is all working. Okay. Thank you, John. And uh, thanks everyone for being here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to run you through what we believe is the first look at shared stewardship in implementation here in Idaho. Um, let me walk you through what the next 50 minutes look like. Um, so I'm Peg Policcio. I'm the uh, North Idaho, excuse me, I'm the state's uh, shared stewardship coordinator. I've been with the state of Idaho for about five years now, um, having retired from the Forest Service, but then um, I was asked by the state, Deb David Greshel and Craig Foss and others, to come, come over to the state and help give them a hand with this thing called good neighbor authority for a year or two. And so I did that for uh, starting in 2015 and I really, really enjoyed it. It was right up in my wheelhouse. And then this thing called shared stewardship came along. Um, we had our good neighbor authority program stood up nicely. Uh, they asked me to stay on and provide some strategic leadership and coordination for this effort statewide. My, my technical career was in fire management and forestry and in leadership uh, in the Forest Service, state and private forestry. So this was right up my alley and it's the one thing that I think for me uh, was important enough to come back to for a few years uh, for a second act. Um, I'd like to introduce or have Jeff Lau introduce himself as well. Go ahead, Jeff. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Lau. I'm the new North Idaho Shared Stewardship Coordinator. I actually officially started this position just this Monday, but I've been acting in the position since last September. Um, I, similar to Peg, I, I, before being in this position, I worked for the Idaho Panhandle National Forest as the timber management officer and uh, was one of a one of maybe a four person group on the Forest Service side that helped stand up GNA along with the state folks, uh, Peg Peluccio and John Songster. And so I'm excited to expand this shared stewardship effort and that's what I got, Peg. Okay, so what we're gonna do, here's how this next 50 minutes is gonna roll. I'll introduce our panel members, our six panel members to you very briefly. Um, then we'll, I'll show you the questions that they're going to answer, and it's kind of a lightning round. Uh, they'll each have about four minutes to, to, make, to, make, to answer these questions that they've seen a few, uh, for a few weeks. Uh, but before we get to that, I'm going to review our backstory. Just a few slides for the people that weren't with us last year in Boise um, that, that need a little bit of backstory uh, to how we got where where we today. Ben Specker talked about it, but just a little bit of backstory for how we got to these two big landscapes in Idaho. Um, and then Jeff is going to come on and he's going to give you an overview of the landscape, bring you into that landscape, talk about the complexity of the land ownership uh, patterns in there, um, talk about the forest conditions a little bit in terms of, it's basically wildland urban interface, he'll talk a little bit about that, and then what it's taken to tackle uh, this first bite of a two million acre priority landscape. After Jeff does his overview, we'll back up again and uh, then I'll walk through the questions with each of our panel members. And then that should leave us about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So that's how we're gonna roll. We're gonna quit at 2.50 uh, Mountain Time for a break and then uh, we'll come back for uh, Dennis's, uh, this final panel of the day with the regional foresters and state foresters. So that's the run of show for this segment. So first up is the six uh, leaders in the North Idaho landscape. Uh, you see their names here and I'm going to walk through really quickly the next slide that has their short bios. 
so you can meet these people. Next. So Jeannie Higgins will be first up on our panel. She is the uh, for supervisor of the two and a half million acre Idaho Panhandle National Forest. Uh, she's, she's in the 40 year club, uh, having had a long and distinguished career in the forest service in leadership positions. She's a big advocate for collaboration and she really is, is a great partner uh, and loves to work with the partners uh, as we look at improving forest conditions. Next up will be Eric Besaw with the Idaho Department of Lands. He oversees the field operations for five northern supervisory areas uh, for the Department of Lands. Uh, he's a specialist. His, you know, he's got 29 years of experience, but his, he's really in his line position. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the endowment lands, or you hear them called the trust lands in Idaho. He has oversight over fire suppression, the Forest Practices Act, uh, forest stewardship for private lands, and now the local GNA in that uh, for his areas. Next. We'll have another speaker from the Idaho Department of Lands, Era Andrea. She's a Forestry Assistance Bureau Chief. These are names and titles you all don't hear. Uh, the Forest Collaborative has been working largely with the Forest Service. These are organized a little bit differently at the state. She has the oversight for the Forest Practices Program, which the uh, state calls a regulatory program, forest health, fire risk mitigation, forest stewardship for private lands, and urban and community forestry, and forest legacy, which is an, a conservation easement program. She's been a bureau chief in other bureaus with the Department of Lands, and she is really all in on this shared stewardship business and the cross-boundary work. She's, a, she's, an ex, uh, she's an expert at these programs and how we deliver to private lands. Next up will be Bob Howard with Bonner County Emergency, Emergency Services. Bob has over 30 years with Bonner County, which is in this North Idaho landscape. Uh, and he has 20 years as the Director of Emergency Services. He was foundational to ve development of the local hazardous fuels treatment program for Bonner County called Bonfire. And Bob is also, I think he's acting as an IC or a deputy IC for the COVID response in Bonner County. So he's a busy guy at that local level. Next. Peter Stegner with Riley Stegner and Associates, uh, a principal at a consulting firm, does natural resources policy. Many of his clients are in North Idaho. Uh, Riley Stegner, uh, uh, Manage, or Riley Stegner represents family-owned businesses, corporate landowners, and others uh, across the country, actually, but particularly in northern Idaho. Uh, he has over a decade in natural resource and environment policy, and he formerly worked for Senator Mike Crapo in Washington, D.C. And then finally, Mike Peterson with the Lands Council. Mike is the executive director of the Lands Council out of Spokane, Washington. He's a member of four forest collaboratives, I, I believe in three states, Washington State, Idaho, and Montana. Uh, and he co-leads the Panhandle Forest Coalition, and he's a key, keystone member of the Shoshone Benoit Forest Health Collaborative. Uh, he's been active in, in natural resource issues for over three decades, and he helped start many collaboratives in the Pacific Northwest or the Inland Northwest, starting in 2001. Next. So the questions will, uh, our panelists are going to answer today when we get to that is, um, how are you and we working together in this landscape? And what contributions do you intend to make toward improving forest conditions to meet our mutual goals? So they've been pondering this for a couple of weeks and we'll get right back to this. Next slide. Um, a real three slides for the backstory. You heard Governor Little and you heard uh, Dennis talk about the uh, Idaho Shared Stewardship Agreement. It's foundational to us here in Idaho. It's what I lean on all the time when people say, well, what does it mean? We're, what are we doing about this? It's, it's that high level commitment, high level uh, leader's intention for us to look at in Idaho. Uh, it was quite a, a, a feat to um, uh, make that happen between all of the leaders uh, back in December of 18 
uh, with the national strategy having been released, I think in August or September. It was quite a, a time of, of a very strong collaboration at the state regional level. Um, so it talks about a collaborative approach to reducing hazardous fuels, improving forest and rangeland conditions. It talks about, uh, you know, the states having a stake in helping set priorities um, side by side with the Forest Service. And that was a little bit different approach. Next. So just to back up very briefly, last year at the conference, we brought forward all the science that we were looking at. We consulted you all on sort of what should this shared stewardship advisory group look like? What should this charter look like for managing or uh, governing this shared stewardship uh, initiative? But what we were thinking about at that time last year was, well, what science is out there to help inform our, dis our decisions around where to look first, where to go first for basically this experiment of shared stewardship? You saw A represent the state forest action plan that was well underway with the best science we had available to the state and many layers and all kinds of people advising. It was a good thing. The Rocky Mountain Research Station fire model was, uh, we talked about that. Dr. Alan Agar brought that forward. And then the forest got excellent data um, they call regional assessments that we could look at that state regional scale, that very high level with excellent data, there was a lot of alignment between the forest health maps, the, all the threats, fire, uh, forest health, uh, development data, or where are the communities, where are the values? Uh, where, there are a lot of values, but where are the communities at risk, basically, in, in, in that, uh, in this, amongst vegetation, burnable vegetation. Next. So again, the why here, why did we, why do we have a circle or a polygon around that North Idaho landscape that you see and the one in Southern Idaho? Lots of features, first the science, but other things. Where did we have foundational relationships where people can work together and get stuff done? We called it alignment. This last year, the agencies have work, been working on alignment at our various levels, you know, regional level, state level, national forest level, ranger district with the, the state folks bringing all this together in sort of a convergence sort of way. Uh, we also looked real heavily at where the projects already underway in the planning stages, um, particularly on the Forest Service because they're already working where there are high risk landscapes, right? In cooperation with their forest collaboratives. So we looked hard at the out year program of work, what's underway, and then, and then what else we looked at was capacity to manage this or to, to to, to engage in something brand new that's outside everybody's normal program of work. Who has capacity for this? Forest Service, state. Where do we have these active GNA agreements underway? That was a feature in the Idaho agreement. We needed to look at that. Where do we have a robust forest industry that can, can move these materials, these hazardous fuels materials, do the thinning work? Um, where is that at? And then how are our counties programs, are they healthy? Can they do work on private lands? Do they have the infrastructure for that? Where do we have willing landowners and a history with willing landowners? Uh, we do a lot of work in forest stewardship on private lands in North Idaho. We knew that was there um, and some in South Idaho. And then where is the collaborative capacity? Where are people working together productively? Where is there a zone of agreement that's evolved over 10, 10 hard years or more? So we're basically, we kind of agree on some of this work up front in the front country, around communities, where we have deteriorating forest health conditions. So that's the why here piece. Next slide. So this is where we're at. We have these two, two, two million acre plus landscapes, a lot of work done to get to these polygons with the Forest Service, the state of Idaho, Key, key individuals from the regions, um, a lot of people to figure out where should we look first uh, with all those considerations. And over here, you see uh, what those land ownerships look like in the Northern Idaho landscape. We're not gonna talk much about the South Idaho landscape today. Things are well underway there now too. 
Jeff introduced himself as the North Idaho uh, Shared Stewardship Coordinator. We're pleased as punch to have him. And just last week, the Forest Service uh, Forest Supervisor on the Boise announced that Lynn Oliver will be the Forest Service IDL landscape, landscape Coordinator for this Boise Payette National Forest private lands intermix piece here. So we now have two coordinators with some capacity to do the enormous amount of coordination that it takes. Okay, Jeff, bring us into the North Idaho landscape. Okay, give me just one second. All right, can everyone see that first slide? Okay, give me a thumbs up if you can see that first slide. All Got right, it. good to go. All right. We all know that forest health and natural resource management issues are not confined or de de defined by our ownership boundaries. You know, we looked at this as how can we build on the existing success stories that we already have uh, in land management in, in the realm of collaboration and cross boundary management. And, and how can we expand upon uh, the coordination of treatments across jurisdictional boundaries um, that will lead to better landscape benefits and capitalize on our limited resources such as budget and people. Uh, private land owners play a critical role in the success of shared stewardship. Sorry for the delay there. In the North Idaho priority landscape area, approximately 51% of the landscape is privately owned, 39% being non-industrial private lands and 12% being industrial private lands. Only 41% of this priority landscape is public. Both the North and the South priority landscape er areas are just over 2 million acres as Peg referenced earlier uh, in size. So where do you or we start recognizing that no one entity can make the changes needed across the landscape on their own. We first hosted a meeting with leadership from the Forest Service, IDL, Bonner County, uh, BLM, and NRCS. And this group identified the need to more clearly define or direct our focus on our initial cross-boundary work to address the forest health and fire, fire risk within this two million acre landscape. Each partner shared their out year program of work and discussed factors such as cross-boundary opportunities, um, known local interests and support. Um, here on the right is a kind of a Google Earth screenshot and the, the, the green area is the Idaho Panhandle National Forest out year program of work. Um, likewise, should pop up here, uh, the, the blue polygons are IDL's out year program of work, as well as uh, Bonner County provided uh, the yellow and red dots that are shown up on the screen of interested private landowners that they know of that are interested in one of the many uh, programs that, that, that is offered through their bonfire program. This process led to the selection of the first focal area, Southwest Bonner County focal area, um, and identified several other potential focal areas within the landscape um, that need additional collaboration and stakeholder involvement. Um, focal areas are geographical areas within the priority landscape where partners will focus and identify projects in conjunction with each other um, working towards a common goal. In other words, this is a way of taking a bite-sized piece of this large priority landscape area. Um, the Southwest Bonner County focal area highlighted in red is an interagency effort to reduce fuels and improve the forest health across all ownerships to create la a landscape where the threat of wildfire to public safety, homes, and infrastructure is minimized. This focal area is approximately 175,000 acres in size and similar to the priority landscape, this focal area is primarily pri private, privately owned. Um, only 22% of the focal area is public. So I cannot emphasize how critical the private landowners and the associated programs provided to them are going to be um, when it comes to the success of the shared stewardship effort in in North Idaho. Um, for just a real quick summary of the projects that have been 
collaboratively identified by each partner within the focal area. The green areas highlighted in the focal area um, is called the Scattered Lamp Project. Um, it's a forest service project that is being recon by DNA foresters on the Sandpoint Range District that is projected um, to be about 3,000 acres in size, targeting forest health and hazardous fuels. Likewise, IDL timber cells and fuels project highlighted in blue. Um, IDL has several timber cells already identified um, within the area, and they have identified and continue to identify opportunities to target hazardous fuels on endowment lands in conjunction with adjacent efforts. Highlighted in pink um, is the Hoodoo Valley Hazardous Fuels Project, which is a Bonner County Emergency Management Project area um, where they currently have interested private landowners and will continue to target non industrial and industrial land uh, owners to reduce fuel hazardous fuels. Um, what's not shown up on your map is the NRCS Equip Project, and that is due to PPI um, protected information. They have had a long history of successfully completing private land fuels projects um, within the focal area, and they plan to target non-industrial private landowners adjacent to proposed treatments previously identified um, to increase the connectivity and effectiveness <coughs> between each partner treatment. Also worth mentioning. Um, is the Clackstone Meadow area, highlighted in yellow. Um, it's owned by Simpson Lumber Company. It's also under an Idaho Department of Land Forest Legacy Program. The green dots, which represent over 6,000 structures in, 6,000 structures in the, in the landscape, sorry, the focal area, is the why we are all at the table. All identified projects are intended to improve the forest health and treat hazardous fuels and we are continually working on improving our relationship with our partners to better understand each other's strengths, constraints, programs, and resources that we all offer um, so we can better leverage each other's resources to improve upon the group success as a whole. And in closing, I just wanted to mention that implementation within this whole area um, could happen as early as this summer to fall, but most of the projects that are being identified within this landscape will most likely be implementable um, the season of uh, 2021. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Jeannie. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so just to reintroduce myself, I'm Jeannie Higgins, the Forest Supervisor for the Idaho Panhandle National Forest. And to answer the questions that um, the uh, panel presented. Um, so how has the Forest Service um, been involved and is working together in this landscape? So a couple of things are really important. Um, you know, Jeff mentioned we identified um, a focal area within the large priority landscape, but I want to back up just a little bit. And we've been working uh, collaboratively across North Idaho for quite some time now. And um, on National Forest System lands, we have been involved in an out-year planning process. For a while, we called it our five-year plan process that was collaboratively developed with um, many stakeholders in North Idaho. That includes um, the collaboratives, that includes county commissioners, tribes, um, the state of Idaho, industry. Um, many folks were involved in, in helping to identify uh, priority landscapes um, to focus our uh, treatment efforts on. This last spring, we did an update to our, um, our five-year plan or out-year plan. And in that process, we identified um, these scattered parcels uh, within Southwest Bonner County that um, Look, normally wouldn't likely get attention. Um, we tend to look at our larger uh, watersheds for treatment. And so the Scattered uh, Lands Project um, was, was born out of that effort. And, um, and now we're focusing on the opportunities for cross-boundary treatment with partners. In addition to um, working collaboratively to develop 
um, projects and um, priority uh, treatment areas, we recognize that in order for us to really ramp up um, our treatments, both um, to double the acres treated on national forest system lands and to look at cross boundary kinds of treatments, we really needed to um, have a, a focus, uh, someone to help coordinate that effort. And um, as Jeff mentioned, he's now the North Idaho Shared Stewardship um, Coordinator that helps us. Um, come together and around these opportunities that we have around cross boundary types of treatments. So another opportunity that we have is, is really understanding how each of us um, can bring our resources to bear um, to both um, strengthen our relationships and um, the resources that we have to accomplish work. There's a variety of different tools out there. We're experimenting with those tools in terms of funding sources tools to actually get project work done. Um, it's been mentioned quite a lot that the Good Neighbor Authority um, is, is, was a focus around identifying this priority landscape. We are actually using the Good Neighbor Authority to help us with identifying project treatments within the um, Scattered Lands Project area. IDL foresters are out there collecting data and information for us to better assess um, treatments that uh, will um, best assist the landscape in terms of achieving those broader objectives. Um, we're also looking at different tools associated with um, actually getting work done cross-boundary and exploring those tools, things such as um, the Western State Wildland Urban Interface uh, Grant Program, the Hazardous Fuel Reduction Grants, the EQIP Program, working closely with uh, NRCS, and um, certainly the Good Neighbor Authority and other kinds of authorities that can help us most successfully accomplish the objectives to reduce fuels and improve forest conditions. Um, beyond the Southwest Bonner County focal area, we're also uh, exploring other focal areas within the priority landscape. There are a number of projects that we are working on developing, and certainly we've had um, cross boundary relationships. Um, where we have uh, had the opportunity to focus on uh, fuel reduction and improving forest conditions, but we're seeking those opportunities in other locations as well. So um, with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Hello, I'm Eric Beesaw with the Idaho Department of Lands. I'm the operations chief for, for, Northern, for Northern Idaho. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about our endowment land management. So, our endowment land management, uh, first most, we are we act as a fiduciary for the endowment and the endowment trust. So our responsibility is to actively be managing our lands and we manage our lands to maximize the long-term benefit for, for the endowments and to, and to generate revenue. As part of that, we do we do planning from the highest level right down to the ground level. That planning process uh, begins with our forest asset management plan, which really looks at our forest inventories and develops a, a long-term plan of management actions for, for those lands. We've just wrapped up our, our latest version of that this, this past year, um, which will actually be going to the land board for approval in, in April here. Uh, each area office, uh, we have 10 offices throughout the state, each area office has been involved in that, in that planning process um, and are integral in developing that management plan. Um, then the next level of planning begins at, at our timber sale level planning, and that's developing a 10-year plan of management activities that will occur throughout the next 10 years. This is a process in which we have the opportunity to, to engage with, with our partners and we can actually integrate some of our, our management activities. Because we have this 10-year planning process, it lines up very well with the Forest Service and their planning process also. So the earlier that we get in on the, this game, 
the more results you can see, like in the map that that's outlined that Jeff has up, you know, that planning process is critical in trying to dovetail some of these activities together. Um, as part of that process too, we have a three year continuous process for our forest improvement projects. And that's our, that's our managing of our young stands, post harvesting type of activity. Um, and as a matter of fact, when, when we began the, the planning process here with the Forest Service on this, we actually identified more forest management activities that, that we could bring in and help supplement and provide some of that adjacency um, through this process. Uh, our broad focus overall for, for IDL in our management is to manage forests to be healthy. And by doing that, through doing that, we try to maintain younger rotation ages. Um, currently, our, our average stand age is, is around 100 to 110 years old. We feel that having stands that are in that 60 to 80 year old category will provide us healthier forests. That's one of our broad focus objectives across the landscape. Um, then to bring this in, actions and connectivities. Uh, we have foresters throughout all of our area offices and we have, and we have been hiring good neighbor authority foresters and they are embedded in a number of our area offices and they work hand in hand with our foresters who are often adjacent to federal lands and they have a they have as much of an understanding of what's going on on those federal lands as they do on IDL lands because often the forest health issues that are occurring on state lands are also occurring on federal lands so um it it just marries up really well to have those two groups partnering together and looking at where we can do and what we can implement on a broader landscape. Um, also our GNA foresters, um, working with the GNA group, we can identify FM projects, forest, our forest management projects that, that can help and supplement and be complement to one another. The last level where, where IDL helps is getting away from the endowment land management side of things, but moving to our private forestry specialists. And here our private forestry specialists who work out in the area offices have a really, really well-developed relationship with the industrial foresters, the industrial land managers, and also the private land managers that are the white areas in the map adjacent that that is pulled up here and they know those people and they can discuss some of the actions that are going to be going and they help to facilitate through stewardship and through planning some activities that that can happen on those lands and from there i will kick it to aira who will talk a little bit more about their programs okay thank you eric and good afternoon everybody I'm going to give a high level overview of how partners have come together to facilitate cross boundary work on private forest lands in the southwest Bonner County focal area adjacent to and in alignment with similar work that's being done on the Panhandle Scattered Lands projects that are planned right here in the Sandpoint Ranger District. Okay, I click. So IDL has great success in acquiring competitive grant awards to help share the financial burden for and to provide incentives to private forest landowners to get this continuity of these cross-boundary treatments through their parcel. Mostly through our fire risk mitigation grant funds, our forest health grant funds, we have some forest stewardship programmatic grant funds, and this year possibly some FEMA source grant monies our program managers in combination with our on the ground foresters, the IDL private forestry specialists that Eric just referred to, and our sub grantee cooperators like the Bonner County Office of Emergency Management, we can provide a significant piece of this puzzle of success in garnering buy-in and participation by these private landowners. Click, please, Jeff. 
So simultaneously, depending on the treatment recommendations of the landowner's parcels and the landowner's objectives on a given piece of ground, NRCS is there providing a wide array of financial assistance programs, including the most popular environmental quality incentives program or EQUIP program. This is to, goes out to private landowners to also kind of increase that capacity to work towards our overall goal of getting these cross-boundary adjacent treatments implemented on private lands. And in this particular focal area, Greg Becker is the NRCS Sandpoint District Conservationist, and he's working collaboratively with us to reach these mutual goals. Click. With a majority of our fire risk mitigation and our hazard reduction grant funds that are distributed to this particular focal area, Bonner County Office of Emergency Management is IDL's primary subgrantee or cooperator and they are ensuring that our grant funds are distributed widely to private forest landowners and in accordance with those landowners' needs. Bob Howard and his team at Bonner County OEM have those close community ties and landowner relationships that make a big difference in our successful dissemination of these programs. In fact, the stars on this map, as Jeff alluded to earlier, they represent where Bonner County has already identified ready to go private forest landowners that are ready to work with us to implement needed treatments on the ground. Click. Oh, I'm sorry, that's it. <laughs> so in close, we are working on agreements and plans with Bonner County and NRCS to strategically market these cross-boundary treatments in alignment with work being done with Jesse Berner and her team on the Sandpoint Ranger District to as many forest landowners in those white parcels that you see on the map to as many of them as possible where it can make the biggest continuous contribution towards our overall goal. And with that, I'll turn it over to our main cooperator, Bob Howard and his team at Bonner County OEM. Thank you, everybody. So a little history, um, as, as you see in, in the bio, we started this program in 2002. Um, <clears throat> when we started that program, uh, we formed the steering committee. We include the Forest Service, Department of Lands, the BLM, and a participant from the fire districts for structural and then emergency management. So we have monthly or semi-monthly meetings um, and we built, that's how we build those relationships with our, with our partners and that started like in 2002. And we also develop our community wildfire uh, protection plan every year, update it um, through that relationship with everybody. Um, so, and we also participate in the North Idaho, the uh, Shared Stewardship Working Group. So <clears throat> several years ago, Bonner County, well, we've done work, we've completed work in the in the focal area for the past several years. Probably the largest several years ago, we did the Highway 41 corridor uh, down through Blanchard in that area. Um, so this year, we received approval for Western State grants for the Hoodoo area, Hoodoo area and, uh, and Tyre Hofelt's with Idaho Department of Lands um, applied for an ad additional funds to the Idaho Office of Emergency Management for FEMA mitigation funds, which we are participating in that grant, and we will we will um, manage part of that grant with Tire um, if that grant is awarded. So we also have relationships with our community partners, uh, grain Grange uh, organizations, community organizations, and um, we will uh, schedule meetings with those organizations and. We'll actually we'll ask uh, Department of Lands Forest Service to um, uh, partner with, with us in those meetings to um, get our public um, message out to those communities and encourage their participation. So, and that's, that's kind of all I have. I was, it was kind of short, but. So it would be uh, Peter Stegner. Yep, thanks, Bob. Peter, you're up. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, appreciate it. Uh, my name is Peter Stegner uh, with Riley Stegner and Associates. And as Peg mentioned, um, we represent uh, uh, large industrial landowners, uh, particularly up in, in the northern part of the state. And as, as folks have said, um, uh, 
multiple times uh, there's a good majority of the landscape up there in that focal area that is indeed private and is private industrial. Um, we really see um, from a large landowner perspective uh, participation in the shared stewardship program from two perspectives. One is we think that we can be an active neighbor and participant um, where we can support local collaborative efforts um, to uh, with the, the shared goal of increasing the pace and scale of forest restoration um, on uh, federal landscapes that will help address all the, the various landscapes and in, in addition to us uh, um, support the associated jobs in the woods and the mills. Secondarily, I think we um, want to bring forward ideas on a more broad landscape based forest health concepts. Um, we're very excited about this strategic cross boundary approach um, that recognizes the need to increase forest health and reduce wildfire risk across multiple ownerships um, where we all know that insect and fire do not respect property boundaries. Um, on the, the first, I, I think it's, it's important that our, um, our companies are very much focused on federal fiber in the market and that we want to make sure to help come up with good ideas that we can uh, increase the scale of federal fiber that comes onto the market that, in a way that doesn't disrupt um, uh, the marketplace and instead encourages capital investment to maintain the, the current milling infrastructure in the region. And then on the cross boundary strategy, we hope to provide the impacted parties with ideas and concepts about how, how best to prioritize things like strategic fire breaks um, and other imperiled landscapes um, that can kind of cross over impacts to the neighboring state and private lands. Uh, we think we bring a lot of the expertise and interest to help identify these projects and where they'll have the greatest impact. Okay, is that it, Peter? That's it. You, you took this lightning round stuff seriously. Thank you. <laughs> okay, finally, we're gonna, Mike Peterson is gonna back clean up for this, uh, the statements or these answering the questions. And we're right on, spot on time. Uh, and then we'll have 10, 10 or 12 minutes for Q and A's. Go ahead, Mike. Great, thanks, Peg. And thanks to all the organizers of the IFRP. This is really unique. Well, the Panhandle Forest Collaboration has been working together for 12 years to find common ground on forestry, wilderness, and recreation on the Idaho Panhandle National Forest. We've worked with the IPNF on multiple projects, and one great example was the Bottom Canyon project. It's up the North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River. And it was remarkable that we uh, jumped in head first with the help of Idaho Forest Group. We actually expanded the scope of the project, more than doubled the acreage. Uh, treatments and did a lot of variable density thinning and just some great work up there in root rot zone central. One of the unique things for me was walking out to find a reroute of a road multiple times on a very steep hillside to move a road off of a, of a floodplain and so that was very uh, very enlightening to see how much work that took and how we all got together on that. We, the Penthouse Forest Collaboratives active in many other projects. Another one I'm working on is right on the outskirts of uh, Hayden Lake and near Coeur d'Alene, the Honey Badger Project. And we are going out on field trips. There's a lot of recreation interest. There's a lot of concern about uh, too many fuels too near the interface. The forest comes right down to where people live. And so that's a great project and uh, with some great civil culture and adherence to the fact that it's on the back doorstep of, of a large population is going to be a great project, I think. And then we've been working with the other collaborative groups. There's two others on the panhandle, the Kootenai Valley Resource Institute, which is on the very far northern part, and the Shoshone Benoit Forest Health Collaborative, which I'm also fortunate to be part of that, which is on the very southern part, mostly on the St. Joe district. What was unique about it, the three of our groups came together at the invitation of the Forest Service to take part in the five-year vegetation management plan. And we got to set up priority criteria, look at areas, make sure each part of the forest was getting some equal treatments. And I really think that was unique across the national forest system and really thank uh, 
the Idaho Pan Am National Forest, Jeannie, and all the great people who worked on that. That we still review it every year or so and add to it, but that was a great proposal and a, a great effort, I think. And then most recently, we also came together on the uh, Collaborative Forest Landscape Project, CFLRP, and hopefully help support the Idaho Panhandle in their application. And we're waiting, we're crossing our fingers that we're gonna hear back on that and we'll get uh, even more resources to do the kind of landscape scale, expanding our touch across the Panhandle. I think I'll just leave it there at that. Um, I just got to commend the great staff on the Panhandle National Forest for really stepping up and working with so many diverse groups and diverse people. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mike. Um, so next up, I'm starting to get some questions coming in. Can everyone hear me okay out there? Okay. And for my panelists, uh, for those of you that uh, are working with a computer, uh, Please get your your uh, please speak near your computer if you can. Um, so Carolyn, you can get rid of those questions. Those were the questions that they kind of did their statement for. Thank you. So I'm getting a few questions in from uh, the chat room, and I'm getting some by text for people who don't want to use the chat room. <laughs> so let's go for him here. Um, first up, I'm going to ask. Um, this one came in earlier and it's from John Robeson from Idaho Conservation League. Which entity, the Forest Service, the Idaho Department of Lands or the Office of OEM or uh, the Bonner County Bonfire Program or the fire districts has had the most success in reaching out to private property owners? Who wants to take that? Bob, Howard, do you wanna take that one? You know, they they go through and they they meet with the homeowners um, with the um, homeowner associations and and folks like that. They actually and we've actually went to uh, homeowners association meetings with the fire district, and um, we go into their home and we do a presentation. And so we we work for the fire chiefs. That's why the fire chiefs association has a person in our uh, steering committee. So they take it back to the fire chiefs. The fire chiefs take it out from there to their um, fire departments. Does that answer the question? Yes. I see John nodding his head. Okay. Next question, Mike Peterson, this one's for you. Collaborative groups have uh, played such a vital role in the success of land management for well over a decade. What roles and opportunities do you see for the collaboratives in shared stewardship? What's going to change, Mike? Well, what I see with shared stewardship is we're going to increase the pace and scale. And we're going to work across boundaries uh, when we can. And I believe the relationships that each of us in those groups, whether it's conservation, timber, recreation, bring, we bring a different part, different community forward and inform them. And so I think that actually coalesces into helping the Forest Service get those projects done. Oh, thanks, Mike. Okay, um, I've got another one on my machine coming in. Um, this is for Jeannie. Jeannie, this is from Tom Schultz. Uh, what, are, what are the one or two things right now that could best assist the Idaho Panhandle National Forest to accomplish your shared stewardship goals in the next six months? Jeannie? Thanks, Peg. <clears throat> so, uh, Shared stewardship goals. We have uh, multiple shared stewardship goals. One of them is um, doubling the acres treated on national forest system lands. Uh, we have um, also an interest in the cross boundary treatments and we have a number of projects that um, butt up against um, private land. Um, Mike mentioned the Honey, ba Honey Badger project that's right up against the city of Coeur d'Alene, the city of Hayden. Um, we have we have other projects that are um, right adjacent to communities, and probably the thing that will help us the most is um, through our shared partnership here, um, through shared stewardship, is really reaching out to those private landowners and um, engaging them in the <clears throat> uh, land treatment opportunities that we have, both on national forest system lands as well as on adjacent private um, 
and other ownerships uh, to achieve those broader outcomes that we're looking for, which is improving forest conditions and reducing fuel conditions. So um, working together and sharing the message, um, sharing the importance of active forest management um, becomes uh, just as important. So thank you. Thanks, Jeannie. Peter Stegner, this one's for you. Uh, the advancement of the Shared Stewardship Initiative would greatly benefit from the cooperation of large industrial forest landowners. Um, we have mutual interests in these uh, landscapes. How can the people that are sort of behind this Shared Stewardship Initiative, how can we best work with large industrial private landowners in this landscape? Well, I think uh, it's a great question. And I, I think that, you know, you have a representative on the advisory committee to help um, guide some of these projects. Um, but I also think that as a lot of um, large industrial landowners are actively involved in their communities or actively involved in, in their collaboratives is to engage those, um, those folks who are on the ground, uh, particularly the foresters and, and, and the employees of the company who are out there every day working on the lands. Um, similar to what we've heard from the Department of Lands folks, um, uh, private landowners know as much as what's going on on the um, federal and private um, forest lands as they do their own and have a vested interest in trying to help um, their neighbors um, come up with projects and solutions that would benefit everyone. So just um, really pushing and, and, and expressing an interest in, in and their uh, input, I think, would, would, would go a long way. Thanks, Peter. Okay, next up, I'm not sure if this should go to Eric or Aira, but I'm going to pitch it to both of you. One of you all pick it up. Um, what about across state lines, particularly with Washington State? Um, how are we going to address these cross-state priority landscape needs? Who wants, I see Aira, do you want to yep, take that? I can do that. Or I can talk about one aspect of it. So we, um, uh, our program managers over these programs I just mentioned, as well as myself, we are in communication. We just recently had a, a Zoom meeting with Washington DNR to talk about the area right across the Washington state boundary from this scattered lands focal area and what that means. And what we're doing right now is trying to word the, the shared stewardship sections of each of our forest action plans to reflect the cross state boundary nature of what we're trying to accomplish, as well as the inter um, state work that we're doing. So we are working on that. We have started those um, talks, especially just west of the scattered lands focal area. And that should be written up and reflected pretty well in our new state forest action plan. Okay, thanks, Aira. Okay, this will be our final question so that people can take a break before, um, before the final panel of the day. And I, I'm gonna take it from Rick Tholen. Rick, I'm glad you're, you're with us today one of the founding members of IFRP and a, um, a foundational member of the Payette Forest Coalition. Rick says, if I'm a private landowner and I want to thin or log my land for revenue, why would I want to do it when the Forest Service and state are logging in my area for my property? So this is about markets. When all that's hitting the market at one time reduce the value I get from my timber, what's in it for me to partner with the feds and the state? And I think I'll pitch this one. Eric, do you want to take that one around markets? And then maybe Peter, just, and then we'll close. Yeah, I, I think there, there's some cooperative stewardship plan money that, that can become available. Um, and we're really looking at the focus of the forest health. And as you look at that, um markets are markets and, and markets are always going to be cyclical um you can try and time the market and small landowners are are best suited to be able to do that um but i think if you look at where where there's some stewardship money that becomes available and if we as we have those funds that are available i think those would make up for any gaps that you would have in actual prices market price okay and finally peter do you want to address that and then we will close 
Sure. I know. I think Eric um, covered it well. I, um, you know, I, th there are always concerns of, of um, market disruptions when you see a glut of, of timber coming onto the market. Um, but, you know, as, as um, I have, and then, and the companies we represent have, have really monitored the situation, the, the projects that we're looking at are not, um, are not designed in that way to be, to just be pushing a lot of wood onto the market. Um, and then to Eric's point, and then as everyone has seen with commodity prices and everything else, um, the markets are very cyclical. So where the, uh, I think a lot of the private landowners in this in neck of the woods, is what we would rather see is to see this incremental sustained approach where you have an increase in supply of wood that helps those who operate the mills um, invest the capital needed to maintain those mills and expand them if needed. Okay, very good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to my panel. You did a fabulous job and for our prep uh, to getting us to this point today. So we're done. And everyone, may, this is time for a 10 minute break. And then Dr. Becker will be on at uh, in 10 minutes to start up the Regional Forester State Forester Panel. So, 10 minute break. Thank you, everyone. And others say in the last panel, we continue to learn together. And at one meeting, I remember someone using the analogy that we're building the roadmap and figuring out our way as we go. And, um, and I think that just really shows all the effort across all Idahoans and folks that we're working with um, on the tribes, the agencies, our NGOs, um, our landowners, just everybody, because we're willing to stick with it. And we have learned a lot and we've come a long way since even a year ago as Peg gave some of the background and history just from the meeting we had a year ago. And we're continuing to move forward in a lot of ways. And just um, speaking for the Forest Service, you know, we've been doing a lot of the, I'll just say, umbrella of shared stewardship for years. And Aira mentioned it in her presentation, you know, through our state and private forestry program, we've done it for a long time across intermixed programs and ownerships, but on the national forest system side of our agency, not, not so much and in a different way. So it's been expanding and growing that collective knowledge, working with our partners and working with others to see how we can really do cross jurisdictional resource management for the resources and the communities in Idaho. And, you know, specific to your question, uh, Dennis, I'm gonna tie in a little bit what I heard from the last panel as well about the funding and how we're working on the implementation side of it. You know, we've had the agreement now that was signed about a year and a half ago, and it had it laid the framework and foundation on some really great goals to move forward with. We heard in the last panel in North Idaho some um, efforts that have been going on and some really hard work on how to bring in with that priority area, some focal area, how to start working across jurisdictions. And we don't have new funding um, for implementation of what we're trying to do across ownerships. We don't have you know, extra money that came in from either state or federal sources, but we have a lot of help that has come and so in 2020, just as an example, Nora and I working um, with our national office and with others, we have been able to, through our state and private forestry program, 
We've had $500,000 that we were able to um, give through state and private forestry to the state of Idaho. And that's helping us build our capacity um, in partnership with the state for like Jeff and Lynn's position, the shared stewardship coordinator positions. It's going towards some of the planning and implementation. We're working collectively with NRCS. We're working with um, many of you, with the state, with um, counties, with tribes, on other opportunities to collectively pool our resources. Some of the grants, Ara, that you mentioned, um, you know, how can we work together to look at those grants and maybe look at the a uh, little bit differently from how we can focus them in an area for the cross jurisdictional to have some incentives for private landowners. Um, in an area where NRCS has equipped money, in an area where um, emergency services have other grants that we're not able to get federally, for instance, or maybe the state's not, but private landowners can't to assist and vice versa. So we're spending a lot of time just learning because I have to say that um, I've learned more about state grants and programs and other grants from emergency services and counties and tribes than I've ever known even existed. And every day it seems like I'm learning more about opportunities um, to work in partnership at a local level, at the state level, at the national level to try and enhance our ability to actually move forward with activities on the ground. And we couldn't do it without all of you in collaboration with our stakeholders and getting all the voices at the table. So we're really working hard to try and keep building that um, as well. So with that, I think I'll pause, Dennis. Um, and if I didn't quite get to all the questions, let me know, but I know um, we'll have other opportunities here too. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. So Nora Razor is a uh, Region 4 Regional uh, Forester, and she's been in that position since uh, 2013. And, and similarly, I've, I've gotten to know you uh, well over the last several years too. So it's this conference is just always a great time to get together and and hear your perspective and, and, and where you're going with things. So my question for you is, really relates to the Southern priority landscape and, and the actions that are just starting to ramp up there. So can you talk a little bit about the time horizon for implementation of treatments in the Southern area, uh, the scale of that planning and how these efforts are related to other ongoing activities? Thanks, Dennis. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, be part of the panel today, so thank you for putting this together. I want to just start with a little bit of background by saying, um, maybe in response to uh, John Roberts, who kicked us off this morning, I really do appreciate how the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership has come together, and the fact that we can have our 10th annual conference, and that every year they are innovative, whether it's the content or for this year, just the way that we can deliver our conference. So. Um, my uh, congratulations to the IFRP group that continues year after year to bring us together and to find ways to work within all the different variations they've had to work through over the years. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for your commitment and for having that leadership um, across the whole state of Idaho. I've been able to attend most of the IFRP conferences since I came here in 2013. And I will share with you that the conference for me is one of the highlights of the year because of that opportunity to bring everybody in Idaho that, that is so invested in improving our forest conditions and doing it in partnership with our communities and with each other. Um, the opportunity to get together, um, to have those hallway conversations, to eat dinner together um, has been very valuable to me. And as I look at retiring here at the end of April, the IFRP and the work we're doing in Idaho with collaboratives will be one of my highlights in terms of something I got to be involved with while I was regional forester. The work we're doing, um, I just look back over the years and I think about how we've, um, we, we had our collaborative groups that got together in our communities and started working together because it, there was something that was important to them that they felt the need to gather together and address. And that continues to evolve year after year. And now we find ourselves in this conversation around shared stewardship. And I really just see this as the next step, the next level of the work that our collaborative groups in Idaho have been at for so many years. 
the reason we can be in the position we're in today to talk about these large landscapes across boundary work is because of the foundation, um, the foresight of the collaborative group members that have been with us, pushing us, pulling us, and being with us all along the way. So thank you to the collaborative groups. Thank you for sticking with us. And thank you for being interested in how we can expand the conversation and include more people. So Dennis, you asked about these, um, the Southern Priority Landscape. And what I wanna share with you in terms of some of the scale that we're looking at and timelines. So in that Idaho Southern Priority Landscape, which is um, approximately 2.3 million acres, big lob on the map there, mostly on the Payette and the Boise National Forest. We looked at that big area and really decided that we needed to uh, zoom in a little bit more on two focal areas. And those two focal areas total 490,000 acres. We got into that conversation with um, Idaho Department of Land and the forests, working together to really think about what are the areas that we can, um, where we maybe have already started work, where we had ideas that we needed to be working there because of the threats and the opportunities. And then how can we really put a boundary around something and get focused on it? And I think the word focal area is important because it does talk about focus. Those two areas, um, so there's a northern focal area, which is 171,000 acres on the Payette. And there's a south focal area, which is 318,000 acres on the Boise and the Payette. Those focal areas contain significant Idaho Department of Land endowment lands, um, portions of the Packer John State Forest, and multiple opportunities for cross-boundary coordination with BLM, IDL, and private landowners. I think this is what's exciting about the work we're doing around shared stewardship is that we really are looking across boundaries and we're looking to see where we have common interests and where we can do work together across those boundaries. The focal areas already have um, a mix of projects that we've done and also some projects that we're planning. We have um, completed NEPA projects already that include fuels reduction projects, watershed restoration, recreation management, and those projects are gonna be completed over the next three to five years. We have planned um, landscape scale NEPA on other landscapes in that area. And so we're gonna continue working on that and then expand and do additional planning on new areas within the focal landscapes. We've also been working with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, and Idaho Department of Lands to identify ways to aid in completing um, and funding priority fuels reduction work on private lands. And I think, again, this is where, what I've seen the difference here with the work we're doing now is that we are more integrated in our approach in an area, and we are able to bring each agency's um, needs, but also their resources to the table so that we can really work across boundary and that we're not um, creating, not having barriers because, well, that's private, we can't do anything there. We really are able to look at the landscape itself and then identify who can contribute what to help get that work done. We, um, so when we met with NRCS and IDL, we were able to identify, um, you know, what, what are the barriers and how can we reduce those for private landowners so they can complete work on private land? And then how can we support each other's programs? So already with shared stewardship, while we may have started out in this conversation between IDL, the state, and the Forest Service, we've brought in our other partner federal agencies. We're bringing in private landowners, as you heard in the previous panel, um, bringing in large uh, industrial private landowners and the small private landowners into these conversations. The collaborative groups um, have been key in this because the work the collaborative groups did already, um, the Payette Forest Coalition, for example, that is foundational to push, positioning us to be able to think even bigger and to include others. And I think this is where the collaborative groups can really help the Forest Service, the IDL, and others out because you know people in your community. 
you have connections with the water district. You understand why other people might be interested in this landscape. And your ability, your ability to tap into your networks and your personal relationships and invite others to join in this conversation is going to be critical to our success. And so while the collaborative groups, I think, have focused on the landscape, I would ask that you also focus on who are the other stakeholders and how might you go about helping them be part of this effort. The collaborative groups, it's, um, it, it will evolve too. And I think most collaborative groups have seen that evolution in the time they've been together. And so I would really even ask the, the collaborative groups to think about how can you envision yourself operating in a different way in the shared stewardship environment. And uh, that's what I've always valued about these IFRP conferences is our ability to actually have those conversations where we can explore the possibilities. So I look forward to the great work that the IFRP is doing with this conference and that our collaborative groups are doing to really make a difference out there on the land for the land, but also for our communities. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Nora. Not sure how I feel about that news. Uh, Will Whelan last year announced his retirement and now you're announcing your retirement here. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for those comments. We'll come back to you with some questions in a little bit. Uh, next, I wanna introduce to you uh, Craig Foss. Um, Craig is the new state forester for the state of Idaho appointed just last month and was previously the division of minister for forestry and fire with Idaho Department of Lands. You know, Craig, you're the new forester to be sure, but you've been around the Department of Lands for a while. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of IDL's role with respect to being a convener of this all lands approach to forest management? What do you see as your role in facilitating activities on private and federal lands while working on your own lands? Thanks, Dennis. And, and I, I do wanna thank the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership and and the leadership that's been involved in putting this together. I know Peg is, is a relatively new member uh, on IFRP, and I know, <laughs> I know going from what you've been doing and everybody's pretty well dialed into doing for the last 10, 11 years to a virtual meeting like this is a ton of work. And, and I, I really just want, want to express my appreciation. Uh, it would have been way easier to just say let's just wait and do something later uh, thanks to all of you for working to put this on and uh, it's it's a pleasure to be part of it so yeah as as uh, Leanne alluded to earlier you know back in back in 2008 and prior now our primarily our primary relationship with the the Forest Service was through state and private forestry programs and for people that aren't familiar with that it's that's really a a relationship between the uh, the state and private forestry arm of the Forest Service and state forestry, state forestry agencies. And we deliver programs like forest stewardship and urban forestry, uh, forest health, the some of the fire programs like state fire assistance and volunteer fire assistance, uh, uh, things like programs like that, but, but really very little engagement in the national forest systems with the exception of of wildland fire, where we really do partner well as agency. But on the national forest system side, on our endowment forest land management side, uh, not, not a whole lot of overlap. Uh, in 2008, through state and private forestry, state, state forestry agencies were asked to put together uh, what, what we call forest action plans. And really the whole idea there was, we really ought to be looking at our forests on a landscape scale. And, and we ought to be thinking when we're delivering programs about what, what, what's, the, what's the need across a landscape, not just what's the need on my ownership. And so that was our first effort at putting together a forest action plan. And, and it, you know, we, we really looked at uh, where are the places on our landscape, forested landscape across all ownerships where we feel there are the greatest threats and where are those places where if we uh, where we could achieve the greatest benefits if we did work. And then we, we threw a GIS exercise, layered that up, and, and the areas, it was like a heat map, the areas that turned brightest red were those areas that, 
that really identified if we devote our, our efforts in those places, we can achieve the greatest uh, outcomes. The problem was there wasn't really any incentive for a lot of the folks to do anything different. Everything's re everybody's really busy doing what they do. And, and so while it was a good exercise and we came up with a map for Idaho, we really didn't see a lot of change on the ground in terms of how we manage and what we do. Um, when the 2014 Farm Bill was passed, uh, there was uh, uh, a program in there, the, the Healthy Forest Restoration Act, and, and, and the, there was a directive for states uh, to develop what we call heifer designations for the, uh, the federal forest or the national forest within their boundaries. And you saw that earlier picture John Roberts uh, showed with the congressional delegation that was at the Restoration Partnership back in 2014. Uh, Nora and uh, 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 Leanne, I'm not sure if you were here, were you here at the time? That was your predecessor, Faye Kruger, pro probably. But you know, the, the regional foresters were in town at the time. They had a meeting over at the Capitol with the governor and our state forester at the time and our director. And the governor directed IDL to take the lead in putting together the heifer designation for Idaho. We came back over to the Restoration Partnership meeting, announced that this was something that we were going to be doing, and we wanted to do it in partnership with the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership, Idaho's collaboratives, and our, uh, our national forest uh, system partners in the regional foresters. So IDL took that effort on. We were really looking at, at insect and disease criteria and fire risk criteria to come up with those designations. You know, what we found is that, you know, there's, there's 21 million acres of, of national forest system lands in Idaho forests. Uh, about 12 million acres are really suitable for management. They're not, they're outside of uh, wilderness areas and roadless areas. So it's, it's really more that fun country that you're gonna manage. And of that 12 million, about 8 million of those acres were at high risk. Um, the original designation that we came up for Idaho was about 1.8 million acres. Uh, since that time, the forests have had the opportunity to increase those designated acres. And now I think that designation stands around 6 million acres for Idaho. But the, 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 the plus to that is that lands that fall within those designations are eligible for. Um, a, a little different level of, of uh, environmental analysis that hopefully could speed some sort of management on those landscapes. So, so that was, you know, an evolution from creating the forest action plan to creating the HEFRA designations for Idaho. But, but the ne then the next question that IDL got about a year later from the governor was, what's going on in the landscape and how can we help? And so that got us to looking at authorities in the farm, 2014 Farm Bill. We landed on good neighbor authority, and that's when Department of Lands got engaged uh, in, in that effort. We signed a master agreement with the two regions um, of the Forest Service. We signed supplemental project agreements with three of our, I'm sorry, four of our seven national forests and started working with our legislature to get funding uh, appropriation and we've st stood up a good neighbor bureau. And then, you know, so that good neighbor really fo focus was largely on national forest system lands. The next evolution is shared stewardship and shared stewardship is just that some people call it good neighbor on steroids, but it's, it's really everything on steroids. It's, it's looking at what national forest systems do it's looking how we help with Good Neighbor. It's looking at what we're doing on endowment lands. It's looking at what ARIS programs are doing through state and private forestry with our non-industrial forest landowners. And then looking at that forest action plan and looking at those highest risk areas and, and identifying, you know what, if we did some treatments in these places, we might be able to have a landscape scale impact uh, through, through these programs. So. Uh, that's that's a uh, hopefully not too much detail, but that's my my perspective on on where we've come from. Now that's great, Craig, and maybe later if we have time, we can uh, we can get other input on uh, on observations of the evolution of these partnerships and and how agency to agency 
relationships have changed over time. Um, I want to come back to, uh, we're going to have some questions now. So we're, I'm going to open this up more for a broader uh, conversation for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And in that, uh, again, just remind you, if you have questions, uh, uh, send them to me in the chat box. I have a couple questions to get us going here. Um, so this, the first one is to Nora. And if you could talk about the impact of shared stewardship on other forests in your region, not so not within a priority landscape area, but especially those places where, you know, I, I'm thinking about different forests that have certainly high fire risk and perhaps not the same timber value. Um, how do you see shared stewardship working in those areas? And can you give us some examples of efforts that are underway in those other areas? Thanks, Dennis. I, um, so when I think about shared stewardship, one of the ways I think about it is really, it's a way of being, you know, it's how, it's a mindset, it's how we approach things. And so it's not just a program. Um, so we might have a shared stewardship agreement with the state and it outlines things we're doing and it identified these priority areas. But shared stewardship is also just an approach. And so that concept is something that we can apply across all forests, um, all programs, all the time. And, um, and so when I think about shared stewardship and its focus on improving forest conditions and protecting communities from wildfires, we have many communities across uh, the forest in Idaho um, where that is a need. And so as I work with each forest and each forest thinks about what's their contribution, um, they really are thinking about things like, what's the right scale of a project that I should be working on? Because that's one of the things that we've you know, come to really better understand is that our problems that we face are very large scale, but our solutions were sometimes too small. So how do we plan at a larger scale, at least strategically, and then know that you have to implement project by project. What, um, and so what that looks like then on any given landscape just depends on the needs on that landscape and the community and the partners that we have. And, and so all forests are looking at ways to approach things from more of that shared stewardship perspective. We're also looking at, um, I think what the priority areas is, um, but how, how can we bring some additional focus to the priority areas and you heard that earlier today, things we're doing about really reaching out, working with partners, finding additional funding, and doing a better job of integrating our projects. And so we will learn about how to work together and what we can achieve in these um, focused areas that we're working on. That learning will then be something we can apply on other forests. And so I really see these priority areas and the focus areas we have is maybe leading the way on some of our work, but then bringing that learning and those opportunities to our other forests. You gotta start somewhere, and this is where we started. Our other forests are gonna benefit from that. The other part of that would just be, again, um, working across boundaries, and, uh, and that's important to continue doing wherever we're at. We also are looking at ways for, um, you know, how do, we, how do we get work done where there may not be a large timber volume, value, uh, but there's much needed work? And, can we, and we've been using Good Neighbor Agreement even to do that type of work because we found that our partner with the state might be able to do the work um, sooner and or with a different lower cost than we could do on the national forest. And so we've been able to use things like Good Neighbor Authority on other areas um, to get work done. So we'll continue to do that. We have um, communities that uh, have other interests, and so we continue to respond to those with that way of being around shared stewardship. Thanks. Great, Thank, thanks, Nora. And I'm just gonna ask a, a follow-up question and then uh, have Leanne respond to the same question. And, and that is, I think it's on, you know, at least on the minds of some folks. So I'm, I'm, I'm helping folks in the Salmon Chalice area in, in the Salmon Chalice National Forest on on project implementation and planning over there. And this isn't necessarily their words or it's my words, but you know, there is concern that, you know, resources might be um, centralized in the priority landscapes. Can you just talk a little bit about how, how resources are, uh, you know, can be expanded or, or the impact of the priority landscapes with respect to funding activities in other forests? 
we're going to continue uh, funding projects on all the forests. So we have a certain level of funding that we get every year. And we know that each forest has needs, communities have needs, and we already have partnerships in place and work ongoing. So we will continue to fund work across all the forests. What we've done, I believe, though, with the having these priority areas is when we receive additional funding or when we spend extra time to go after additional funding or find other more partners, those might get more, that work may be more focused in the priority areas. Other areas are going to continue to do work. Great, thanks, Nora. Leanne. Yeah, I'll build off of um, Nora's answer a little bit because um, I agree with what she said wholeheartedly. And part of also what I was thinking about as, as she was talking and listening to her answer was not only will we be learning on in our priority areas and sharing that with other forests across the region, not just in Idaho, but across states because we're all learning from each other, but just as important, there's a lot of work going on on forests that are not part of the priority areas right now that we're learning from and bringing into the priority area work as well. So it's definitely, I think, um, both a two-way street because uh, we're always learning. We're learning from our neighbors in Montana, in Washington, in Oregon. We're learning with other um, state foresters and other regional foresters through the Western Forest Leadership um, Coalition with LIT. And so we continue to learn from each other. And I think that's the key is it's not an initiative. It's not in an area. As Nora said, we have to start someplace, but it's a way of being, it's a way of relationships. It's building those relationships and learning from each other and working collectively across jurisdictions to enhance our ability to do the right work in the right place at the right scale and at the right time. So I think as long as we keep open with that and we really work with our collaboratives, with our stakeholders, whether or not it's a formal collaborative group or a collaborative process, as long as we keep that local base interest part of the equation and being open to learn from each other, I think this will just continue to grow and it will, it will be more than just what are we doing in these priority areas. It'll be just how we're doing work across natural resources, regardless of where the lines are on a map. So that's what I would just add um, and piggyback with Nora. Great. Thanks, Leanne. So I have a, a different question, Leanne, for you, and okay. that's related to uh, tribal lands. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, we have a significant amount of tribal land in Idaho where perhaps shared stewardship could provide a positive source for, for activity. Can you talk a little bit about opportunities with specific tribes and, and perhaps even particular projects or priority areas that, um, that you're considering? Sure, and I think I'll, um, I'll use just a couple examples of some work and then try and tie it into the latter part of that question. So we work very closely, um, and I know Nora does too in Southern Idaho, but um, in North Idaho, with multiple tribal nations. And I know particularly locally, the four supervisors, Cheryl and Jeannie and Kim and Marty and others have great working relationships. And we're constantly working with the tribes and the elders and the tribal councils on what we can do collectively and have for years um, working together. And a couple examples that I can um, maybe put out there that is running through my mind and answer to the question is, for instance, I know we work a lot with the Nez Pierce tribe um, on multiple restoration watershed aquatic fishery programs. We have a huge um, youth program with the Nez Pierce tribe and working with them. And I see all of that is just a great example of a shared stewardship relationship, if you want to put that title on it, on how we build from the ground up those relationships and tie that into all the work we do for the natural resources and for the communities. You know, having our youth and their tie to the land is integral to everything we do. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're um, part of the Forest Service or if you're a private landowner or a tribal nation, we all value that connection with the land and the relationships and having our youth have that connection. So working with tribes, um, to me, that's a great example it's not part of the priority area or, you know, has, we weren't thinking of it as shared stewardship with that umbrella at the time, 
But to me, it definitely is an example of that type of relationship and how we've been working on that and opportunities to learn and grow. On the same side, we're working um, similarly with like the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho um, up um, with the panhandle we have for years on CFLRP projects and working at large landscapes and in partnership there. And they are um, part of members of, I think it was Mike Peterson mentioned the KBRI um, collaborative group and been very much an integral um, um, partner in that collaborative group as well as working with them in government to government uh, relationships. So I think we've got a lot of great foundational work. And I think, again, it's about relationships and really being open and listening and hearing and adjusting and working together to meet mutual needs. Um, because we don't always see or understand each other's needs, but how else are we going to do it unless we just work together and just talk and learn and then be open to adjusting ways we may have done things in the past to enhance that so it's across all those jurisdictional boundaries and more importantly, it's for all the people. Great, thank you, Leanne. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple questions here um, related to measures of success and what success looks like. And so maybe I'll, I'll start with Craig and, and um, I think there's time we can come back to Nora and Leanne if you have something that you'd like to add to it. And, and so Craig, you know, maybe thinking about it, you know, we have this, we have you know, a couple things here. First, we have the MOU, of course, with this uh, commitment to doubling of acres. Um, we have the governor's uh, shared stewardship advisory group, who is you know, the function, and perhaps you can talk a little bit about the function of that group, but is to, to help inform and advise these activities and the liaise uh, between agencies and, and landowners and so forth in the implementation of this planning. You know, you know talk a little bit about how the committee has been looking at measures of success uh, from your vantage, what are appropriate measures of success? How do we know when we got there? Well, thanks for the question, Dennis. Uh, well, the, the Governor's Shared Stewardship Advisory Group uh, really is, is, is new. They've, they've met once, uh, they've formed subcommittees, and, and one of those subcommittees is focused solely on metrics. Uh, what 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 are we going to measure uh, so that we can establish some some baselines right up front and what does success look like uh, we just had a, a meeting with the governor's office yesterday the committee chairs to report out we've also got a communications group and another group that's looking at uh, at uh, opportunities that that we ought to be looking at bringing into this initiative to help kick it off um, so so the answer to, to how are we going to measure it is we're still working on that. Uh, we, we don't have that figured out, but I'm confident that we'll have, uh, we've got a lot of good ideas. This is also being worked on at the national level because everyone's, everyone's paying attention to this program. And, and if we could establish some common set of metrics, that might help us all to be speaking the same language when we're talking about what's going on in the landscape and what does success look like. So, so we're working on that. You know, I think the, the reason, I don't think, uh, I know the reason uh, that we incorporated the doubling of acres into that agreement was it comes back to the magnitude of the forest health challenges that we're facing in, in Idaho and uh, how important it is that we, we really take an aggressive approach to dealing with, with uh, those challenges. We've, we've really focused our efforts on the front country. We're not talking about wilderness areas. We're not talking about roadless areas. We're, we're really focusing our efforts on those areas where there's an ability to manage. And the reason we're working closely with the collaboratives is, is they're a, an integral part to, to identifying where there's social license to do to do work on our landscape, um, but but it's extremely important that we're treating the right acres. If if we can treat the right, the most strategic acres, then it may be that by treating fifty or hundred thousand acres, you're having an impact on five hundred thousand acres. Um, uh, and and so what what we did as we worked to develop those priority landscapes in Idaho was we looked at our forest action plan, which we're just in the process. I said we did the first one 
I think it was completed in 2010. We're just in the process of updating and completing a revision to that plan with, with updated data. So we work closely with the Forest Service and uh, the Rocky Mountain Experiment Station and use some very progressive uh, wildfire risk modeling to overlay with our forest action plan. And that really helped us identify the two priority landscapes, the north and the south priority landscapes. We're continuing to work with, with the folks that develop those tools. We're also working with you, Dennis, and some of your folks at the University of Idaho who are tied in with those Forest Service researchers. At, at how, how can we continue to use those tools to measure success? How does that fit into how we got to identifying these places on the landscape? So it's an ongoing effort. I, I, I would really emphasize that we're looking at these two landscapes as, as models. We're, we're learning a ton. We will learn a ton over the next number of years when we work on them. Um, and, and hopefully what we learn, then we can take and, and grow that across the landscape. Because that doubling, acre, doubling of acres that we're shooting for isn't just in these landscapes. It's, it's across Idaho. And, and so all of our other efforts are going to continue. All of IDL's, all of our staff, we still have staff located across the state in ARIS programs, in uh, private forestry, our endowment foresters, our good neighbor foresters, many of them located in areas outside of these landscapes. They're gonna continue to do the work that they do, but we're gonna be, uh, as much as we can, bolstering resources within these landscapes. We've got two shared positions with, with uh, the forests, uh, a shared position that's gonna be the coordinator for the North Idaho landscape. It's a, it's a Forest Service employee that will be working out of our Coeur d'Alene IDL staff office. And also there's another uh, Forest Service employee uh, that will be working out of our Boise headquarters office to focus on oversight for that Southern Idaho priority landscape. And then, you know, Peg Policcio, uh, uh, who, who we brought on to help us stand up good neighbor, she did it. Then we brought her in to help us kick off shared stewardship, and she's doing it. But Peg's tried to retire multiple times, and she has insisted to us that she actually will retire this summer. And so, uh, we're hoping to conduct interviews in the next uh, in the next month for her replacement. And uh, instead of that being a contractor, we're looking for that to be an ideal employee. So we'll have statewide coordination. Uh, one of the big jobs for that person is to staff the Shared Stewardship Advisory Group, work closely with the governor's office of those committees, and then be that go-between between that group and the two priority landscapes, so Shared Stewardship Coordinators, and all the activities going on in those landscapes. Great, thank you, Craig. Um, Leanne, would you care to add anything about metrics of success? No, the only thing I would add is, um, you know, Craig mentioned there's definitely a lot of work going on nationally as well. And I think it's John Robeson is heading up the subcommittee. Um, yeah, he's nodding, I got the right person. And thank you, John, for that, because I'm looking for you to have all the answers for us, <laughs> what, what it looks like, okay? Um, but I think it's just, I think the fact that we've got multiple folks working on it nationally, I know working with other states in the Northern region and my guess is Nora does in her region as well. And they're working collectively and trying to communicate. I think that's gonna be key. So we don't have separate, it needs to be locally based and ground based and work for the, the area, but at the same time have some type of maybe consistency there on what it looks like and how we're thinking about the outcomes um, from that standpoint. And so I just appreciate a lot of the really smart people coming together trying to help figure it out um, from there. And then the only thing, uh, other thing on a little bit different is, um, you know, Craig was mentioning the doubling of acres and just a reminder uh, that I know many of the collaboratives um, help bring this voice to the table on multiple fronts is there's a lot of different ways of doing active management on the ground. And there's a lot of different tools to do that to meet the objectives. You know, um, prescribed fire, there's obviously um, different types of vegetation treatments we can do out there. And there's different objectives for doing it. Um, communities at risk from wildfire, it could be for watersheds and um, grazing. I mean, there's, 
And we worked that into our agreement in Idaho, knowing that one size doesn't fit all, and it's not going to be all the same types of active management treatment um, on every acre to build in that flexibility because there's definitely a need, but it doesn't mean that it's the same type of treatment across all the different acres. So just keeping in mind that doubling of acres can be a variety of activities to meet a variety of outcomes that we're looking for. And with that, I'll let Nora um, take team or add, clarify anything she'd like to. Thanks, Leanne. Um, so when I think about this um, idea of measures of success, um, one of the things that comes to mind for me, am I on? Yes? Yeah. Okay. One of the things that comes to mind for me is that um, I, I know when I got started on this shared stewardship agreement, here was my measure of success. Can I stand with the governor of Idaho during the most worst fire season we've ever had shoulder to shoulder and say, we're in this together. Um, yes, we're dealing with this fire. We will have fires. We're, we want to be able to manage them on the landscape in a way that protects communities and watersheds. For us to be able to stand together and say, we're managing this fire. And by the way, the treatments we've done here across boundaries are making a difference in our ability to manage this fire. And the work we're doing um, over many years to come is going to protect community watersheds. So I, you know, I think about it from a, and that's hard to measure. Like you're gonna get a performance measure that says the regional forester and the governor stood together and agreed. Okay, well, you know, maybe that's not the performance measure we want. Um, but I think we need to think about, you know, what, how this might show up. And, um, and I think the other thing to think about is it, we are still are in this for the long term. Um, and, and so whether we treat double the acres or create um, more outputs, it's still a long term investment. And I think the work that we're going to be doing, therefore, it's really important that we have strategies and that we're prioritizing our work. And as someone mentioned earlier, that we're treating the right acres in the right places. Um, we might put a circle around something that says 100,000 acres. We might not need to treat 100,000 acres for a fuels perspective. If we put the treatments in the right place, we can reduce the um, spread of fire across that landscape, protect the community and the watershed. So some measure of, are we really being strategic enough and prioritizing our work in a way that we really do get after this work, recognizing it's gonna take a long time to really accomplish what we wanna accomplish. And it will never end. I mean, our forests should remain healthy. We should get products off of them. We will always have fire as part of our ecosystem. But how do we live and, and work in a different environment than we find ourselves today? Great, thanks, Nora. So we have one minute left, and I have a question that I want to pose to Nora to wrap up this session. And in doing so, I want to um, I congratulate her as many comments in the chat box that you can see or privately to me is just thanking you for your leadership and everything you've done through these years in the Intermountain region. Thank you for that. On that note, I have a, a question from, the, from a member of the Boise Forest Coalition about retirement and personnel changes and you know the the ever you know rotating uh, door of, of leadership um, can you talk a little bit about uh, from your vantage uh, what future managers need to understand not, not what they need to understand but how do you ensure some continuity with leadership i suppose for this sort of all lands cross-boundary collaborative approach that we have You're on, you're on mute right now. Can I get you off? I can't get you off. Okay, there we go. I tried to get off, but somehow we were uh, canceling each other out. <laughs> well, thanks, Dennis. We're, we are going to have people come and go all the time. I mean, just when we started the conference today, um, John Roberts talked about the group that started with IFRP at the beginning and how that's evolved over time. People um, decide to pursue other things. Peg's gonna try to retire for the third time. Um, you know, uh, Craig's new in his job. And so I think um, it's kind of like the ecosystems we work in, 
we want to have diversity and we want to have a strong foundation so that when people come and go, um, the rest of the ecosystem, the rest of the system can absorb that, that change. And when I think nationally with the Forest Service, really focusing in on this concept of shared stewardship, it's what we hire for. So when I'm hiring a leader to come in, I am looking at their ability to show up in a way that truly represents this concept of shared stewardship. And the values that we have in our agency around conservation and interdependence are critical values to look through when we're hiring someone. And then when I, once I get them on board, it really is about how do I set the, um, my expectations for how they will interact. And I would say through this COVID-19 situation, you know, it's been a way for us to demonstrate that we have these values of interdependence and working with each other. And so I think you'll see more and more leaders showing up that hold this value set and that um, they're going to be able to take these partnerships and this collaborative work to a, a, like a whole different level than Leanne and I have even imagined at this point. So you got to hire for it. You got to have the values within your organizations to really have the foundation. And then there's the transition piece. And we really do focus in more on the transition part. Like who are the partners? Who do you need to know? How do we show up in this landscape? How do we work together? Um, it's more than just running your forest. It's about being part of a much larger community. And I think anybody that comes into this region and has the ability to work with the Idaho Forest Restoration Partnership and our collaboratives and our groups in Idaho, I, that's the great part of the job. I mean, it's like, it's great to show up in Idaho. So I want you all to keep it up, to be inclusive and to be open and be collaborative and work with each other and really make, whether it's my replacement or a new forest supervisor or a new ranger, feel like they're part of what's happening in Idaho because it's really great stuff. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. That was uh, that was great. So I see lots of great body language. People are nodding and smiling and waving and thumbs up. So yeah, we just very very much appreciate those comments. So with our with our final minutes here, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, stop the, this panel. Um, we just have a, a, a just a little bit more to go. Just a few more minutes. I'm gonna kick it back to uh, Dr. Freemuth to uh, guide us through a little bit of a summary of today and to set us up help set us up for tomorrow. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Dennis. And again, let uh, me echo for everybody a thanks to Nora. And hopefully she'll continue to maybe whisper in our ears about what's going well and what isn't going so well as, as we move the collaborative thing down the road. Dennis and I were able to uh, talk offline when this is going on. And one of the things we want to do is find a way to get your thoughts, all of you who've been in attendance today and tomorrow, about a, a number of things. I mean, we have our ideas, for example, how this cross boundaries thing works or doesn't work, depending on how we understand it. What didn't get discussed today that perhaps people wanted to hear more about and what we thought we could do to some extent is have you respond on Zoom that they can archive your Zoom chat comments for both Dennis and I, and I will, because Dennis is Dean and he gets a lot more emails than I do. I can provide my email here in a second if people want to email thoughts or comments. Then Dennis and I tomorrow for the 15 minute kickoff can focus on those a little bit. So I know how hard it is to, to listen all the time and not in here not even be able to raise your hand to say something, but, but that's, our, that's our plan. Um, Maybe I'll throw one thing out and then give it back to Dennis. And that's the sense of, and Governor Little said it too, one of the reasons we were able to move ahead on shared stewardship, or you were able to move ahead, is what underpinned it were these collaborative relationships where there was a lot of trust already developed that allowed people to begin to work on this cross-boundary business. So the question still remains, and, and Governor Little talked about body languages and so forth, the things you see when you're looking at each other across the table. Um, we wanna make sure that that continues. And if you're getting your concerns that you're not able to do that as much, you know, that's something we can talk about tomorrow morning if it is becoming a concern. So 
those are a couple things I came up with, Dennis, and I know you had some other ideas about some things that came up on air quality and, and some other things. So um, we can just talk for a minute while people can maybe send in their thoughts through chat and then uh, I'll put my email on while you're, while you're visiting with everybody. Yeah, great. So I'm welcome to take emails too. Maybe, maybe John doesn't have a lot of friends anymore and he just wants some more emails. No. So please, please help <laughs> him out. Um, just, yeah, we talked about a lot of things today. Of course, today's focus was to be more on, on actual activities, the planning that's underway to, to get some perspective from the regional foresters and the state forester at, at those levels and, and their vantage. Tomorrow's gonna be more of a focus on, on the actual collaboratives and, and some of the collaborative activities. And so, you know, we have Chelsea MacGyver in the morning. Uh, we'll be talking about um, some of the research actually that her and I have been working on her primarily in all honesty. Um, about some of the findings of Idaho's collaboratives and, and comparing collaborative projects and, and the implementation of those projects and the time to completion and just a lot of metrics around those. It's, it's, it's a fascinating sort of analysis of, of some of the metrics um, to, to hopefully you know, help us think about um, you know, the effectiveness. You know, really, it's a question of are collaboratives effective at changing the pace and scale of treatments on federal lands. That's really the research question we're trying to answer. And, and then after her, we have Tony Chang uh, from Colorado State, who's going to be talking about you know, some of the, and Tony, I know you're on the line here. If you are still on the line, you can, you're welcome to jump in too. But you know, talking about how do, we, how, do, how do we collaborators evolve and how do you sustain those efforts over time? And you know, we, we talked a little bit about it just a bit ago with, with Nora's uh, response and, you know, and, and, and how do you establish sort of that, as Rick Thullen always likes to say, that muscle memory and, and how do you do things? How do you do business? And, and I'd like to think that we've done that over time here, but yet it is, it's something that can go away if we're not attentive to, to it. And so, so I'm looking forward to those, um, those comments tomorrow. Um, just to build off of uh, John just a little bit more. So, you know, we did hear from the governor about, um, you know, the age of, COVID and, and activities and how do, we, how do we maintain progress? I think it's, you know, COVID really puts a, a, highlights it and really accentuates it in some ways, but it really is just part of a broader conversation about how do we continue to maintain progress? Um, you know, there's a lot of great questions that I wasn't able to get to in this panel about you know, we have these landscape areas, we have these boundaries, and we're talking about cross-boundary collaboration. And one of the things that I like, you know, the, the folks from the different collaboratives, if, if we have an opportunity tomorrow, or if you email your, your responses to John tonight, is, you know, think about, you know, what is working or, or really what is the local challenge? You know, it's easy to, to sort of talk about it at this sort of general level across the state and, and there's a lot of good intention and a lot of goodwill, but from your local vantage point, you know what what's not working? Um, what do you see as the challenges? You know, is it lack of a timber market? Is it lack of contractors? Is it, you know, really that we don't have buy-in across the community and how you're defining community? So whatever those nuances are, I think those those are very important, particularly you know to the to the governor's uh, advisory group on shared stewardship and others who are. Who are leading this to, to hear those those perspectives and so um, as much as today was really sort of at, a, at, a, at this level of a conversation with those leaders and that leadership you know we really want tomorrow to be uh, much more focused on the collaboratives themselves and, and the challenges and the successes that you're seeing with this and so so i encourage you again uh, just to provide uh, feedback and and uh, and push a little bit John, any final comments? No, I think you've ended it pretty well, Dennis. And I think people probably given, as we all know, even though there's not a reception we can all go to now, that people probably know we're supposed to end at four. So they will keep the chat room open. I understand a little bit. You can capture some of your questions. And I put my email up. If, if uh, you can't do it now, but you can do it over the evening. And I'll share them with Dennis. And we'll, we'll talk about those first thing tomorrow morning. Great. Thanks, everybody, for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you all.